Hello all and welcome to another read through of Jurassic Park here. Can everybody hear me? How are we doing? I just want to make sure I can be heard first before we get started here. How are we doing over on the Twitch side? Hello all and welcome to another read through of Jurassic Park. Alright, it looks like we are getting what we need here. Just trying to, all right. How's everybody doing today? Everybody doing all right? Perfect, perfect. Glad to hear that everything is working. Um, let me, give me just a moment here because I do want to go and set up my TikTok live as well today. So that way we can get some, uh, some folks over from TikTok out here. To all the eight viewers here in the uh, Twitch chat, thank you all so very much for joining me tonight. How are you guys doing? Or not tonight, but this afternoon. How are you guys doing? Cryptic? It your boy, casual guy, and interrupter. Thank you guys all for being in the chat and chatting. Donner, th hi, nice to meet, nice to see you in here. Um, let's see, let's see how the YouTube's going. Hi guys, how's everybody doing? Yep, yep, yep. All righty, three streams this week. I know it's it's a lot more than I normally do. Give me just a second here, and we will get this road on the show. <clears throat> sorry, folks. Sorry. We're just getting all this set up. Jurassic Park. I thought I already had it set up, but I guess not on TikTok. <clears throat> all righty no you guys are the goats thank you for all being here in the first place i appreciate every single one of you from tiktok to twitch and everywhere in between I, everyone who's watching me thank you all so very much um if anyone ends up joining me on tiktok thank you all so very much as well i will be doing my best to check all three chats as we go along but uh without any further ado we should get this road on the show so Let's get started, shall we? <clears throat> so, just for reference, last time we left off, we had just left Hammond after he had introduced, or after him and Gennaro had begun conversations with one another. They were arriving in Choto to pick up the other, um, the, the other main characters like Grant, Ellie, and so on. So, give me just a moment here, just want to adjust the camera a bit. So that way you guys have the most ideal. Hello, everybody here in the uh, TikTok chat as well. Thank you all so very much for joining me. And uh, get ready. Uh, I will say we, you guys on TikTok are a little far behind compared to the folks on YouTube and Twitch. But that's all right. You don't need to have the first part entirely. <clears throat> Master Key, thanks so much for joining us here on Twitch. Yes, he does. You are exactly right. Ma uh, Malcolm does appear. Anatomical, hi there. Um, all right, let's see. Hello, everyone over in the uh, YouTube as well. If I didn't already say it, thank you all so very much for joining me here today, and it's much appreciated. <clears throat> now then, without any further ado, dry plains stretched away toward the distant black buttes. The afternoon wind blew dust and tumbleweed across the cracked concrete, and Grant stood with Ellie near the jeep and waited while the sleek Grumman jet circled for landing. I hate waiting on money men, Grant grumbled. Ellie shrugged. Eh, goes with the job. Oh, hold on, I almost forgot my little ambiance light down here. Add a little extra mood to this whole thing, right? Also gives me a little bit of extra lighting. <clears throat> I'm sorry you don't like analog horror, but uh, it's it does tend to happen. It comes with the territory, you know what I'm saying? Um, let's see here. Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to pause the Twitch chat. It is pretty difficult for me to read. I'm not going to lie, but we, we'll get through it here. What's up, guys? Everyone here on TikTok, thank you all so very much for joining. Um... And, uh, oh, thanks everyone in uh, TikTok for the roses and such. Much appreciated. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Anywho, I hate to wait on the money men, Grant grumbled. Ellie shrugged. Goes with the job. Although many, although many fields of science, such as physics and chemistry, had become federally funded, paleontology remained strongly dependent on private patrons, which is still true today. Quite apart from his own curiosity about the island in Costa Rica, Grant understood that if John Hammond asked for his help, he would give it. That was how patronage worked. How it had always worked. The little jet landed and rolled quietly towards them. Ellie shouldered her bag. The jet came to a stop and the stewardess in, blue, a stewardess in a blue uniform opened the door. Inside, he was surprised at how cramped it was, despite the luxurious appointments. Grant had to hunch over as he went to shake Hammond's hand. Dr. Grant and Dr. Sadler, Hammond said. It's good of you to join us. Allow me to introduce my associate, Donald Gennaro. Gennaro was a stocky, muscular man in his mid-thirties, wearing an Armani suit and wire flame wire frame glasses. Grant disliked him on sight. He shook hands quickly. When Ellie shook hands, Gennaro said in surprise, you're a woman. These things happen, she said, and Grant thought she doesn't like him either. Hammond turned to Gennaro. You know, of course, what Dr. Grant and Dr. Sattler do. They're paleontologists. They dig up dinosaurs. And then he began to laugh, as if he found the idea very funny. So before we continue here, <clears throat> that's something that's very relevant in the paleontology and just a lot of scientific fields today, unfortunately, is just sexism in the field. You see Gennaro's immediate reaction to her being um, like, oh, I, I'm Dr. Sattler is, oh, you're a woman? Even though she, and don't get me wrong, this was in the 90, 90s, this was a different time period, all that kind of stuff, but it's still relevant today because these kind of things are still happening today. People don't like to accept women in fields of science, especially older folks, and that's become a huge problem in the scientific field. However, as time goes on and we become more progressive, this problem begins to wane and the women scientists can really begin to shine. <clears throat> well, uh... Thanks for being here on Twitch, but I, uh, oh, alrighty. <clears throat> Wait, what happened there? I, I wasn't quite sure, but if, uh, if folks are in here, thank you all very much for watching. Oh, I got 40 folks in the TikTok chat. Thank you all so very much for being here. <clears throat> Anyways. Hammond turned to Gennaro, or no, take your seats, please, the stewardess said, closing the door. Immediately, the plane began to move. You'll have to excuse us, Hammond said, but we are in a bit of a rush. Donald thinks it's important we get right down there. The pilot announced four hours flight time to Dallas, where they would refuel and then go to Costa Rica, arriving the following morning. And how long will we be in Costa Rica? Grant asked. Well, that really depends, Gennaro said. We have a few things to clear up. Take my word for it, Hammond said, turning to Grant. We'll be down there no more than 48 hours. Grant buckled his seatbelt. This island of yours that we're going to, I haven't heard anything about it before. Is it some kind of secret? In a way, Hammond said, we have been uh, very, very careful about making sure nobody knew about it until the day we finally opened the island to a surprised and delighted public. <clears throat> Hello to everybody joining us here in the YouTube chat, and goodbye to everybody leaving. And same with everybody on Twitch and TikTok. Thank you all so very much for joining me here today, and uh, I hope you all are enjoying. Now, sorry, I keep getting distracted, so let's get right back into it. <clears throat> the Biosyn Corporation of Cupertino... Ca this next chapter is called Target of Opportunity. The Byerson Corporation of Cupertino, California, had never called an emergency meeting of its board of directors. The ten directors now sitting in the conference room were ir irritable and impatient. It was 8 o'clock p.m. They had been talking amongst themselves for the last ten minutes, but slowly had fallen silent, shuffling papers, looking pointedly at their watches. What are we waiting for? One asked. One more, Lewis Doxon said. One more. We need one more. He glanced at his watch. Rem Meyer's office had said he was coming up on, on the next 6 o'clock plane from San Diego. He should have been here by now, even allowing for traffic from the airport. You need a quorum? Another director asked. Yes, Doxon said. We do. That shut them up for a moment. A quorum meant that they were going to be asked to make an important decision. <clears throat> and God knows they were, although Doxon would have preferred not to call a meeting at all. But Staring Stairgarden, 
the head of Biosyn, was adamant. You'll have to get your their agreement for this one, Lou. Depending on who you talk to, Louis Dachshin was famous as the most aggressive geneticist of his generation, or the most reckless. 34 as a graduate student for planning gene therapy. 34, balding, hawk-faced, and intense. He had been dismissed by John Hopkins as a graduate student for planning gene therapy on human patients without obtaining the proper FDA protocols. Hired by Biosyn, he had conducted the controversial rabies vaccine te test in Chile. Now he was the head of product development at Biosyn, which supposedly consisted of reverse engineering, taking a co competitor's product, tearing it apart, and learning how it worked, and then making your own version. In practice, it involved... In practice, it involved industrial espionage, much of it, much of it directed towards the InGen Corporation. So obviously, Dachshin here is setting up um, a whole situation, right? It's very similar to the movie, but Dachshin's more involved in the books here, and especially during the second book. But we'll, we see more of him there, but we'll still see him in this book a couple times. <clears throat> Let's just check out the chat real quick. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying yourselves. Oh, some folks are making breakfast. Some folks are just getting done with breakfast. Man, must be morning for some folks still, huh? Well, I hope every single one of you is enjoying yourselves. And uh, everybody's still here on Twitch. Thank you all so very much. Everybody here on TikTok, thank you guys all too very much. No, unfortunately, I'm not going to do a face reveal, but you can see the book if you want. This is the cover for the book because it's got both Jurassic Park and The Lost World in it. Um... So that way, those of you can see here, Jurassic Park and The Lost World. <clears throat> All right. In the 1980s, a few genetic engineering companies began to ask, what is the biological equivalent of a Sony Walkman? These companies weren't interested in pharmaceuticals for health. They were interested in entertainment, sports, leisure activities, cosmetics, and pets. The perceived demand for consumer biologicals in the 1990s was high, and InGen and Biosyn were both at work in that field. I heard a little notification. What just happened there? Narf Show, thanks for subscribing on YouTube. Much appreciated, Narf Show. <clears throat> for those of you, I see a couple folks saying, uh, you, I'm your favorite dinosaur tuber. Thank you all so very much. That, that means a lot to me, actually. And uh, I appreciate you all for watching me in the first place. Now then. Biosyn had already achieved some success, engineering a new pale trout under contract to the, to the Department of Fish and Game in the state of Idaho. This trout was easier to spot in streams and was said to represent a step forward in angling. At least, it eliminated complaints to the Fish and Game Department that there were no trout in the streams. The fact that the pale trout sometimes died of sunburn and that its flesh was soggy and tasteless was not discussed. Biosyn was still working on that, and the door opened, and Ron Meyer entered the room, cutting off Dachshund's thoughts, and slipped into his seat Dachshund now had and slipped into his seat. Dogson now had his quorum. He immediately stood. Gentlemen, he said, we're here tonight to consider a target of opportunity. InGen. Dogson quickly reviewed the background. InGen start up in nineteen eighty one with Japanese investors. The purchase of three Cray XMP supercomputers and the purchase of Isla Nublar in Costa Rica. The stockpiling of amber. The unusual donations to zoos around the world from the New York Zoological Society to Rathapan Wildlife Park in India. Oops, sorry, my headset shut off. I don't know what happened there. <clears throat> sorry, Trout Gang. <laughs> that's, a, that's a funny one. Soggy Trout Gang. We, we all in the soggy trout gang? Everybody everybody enjoying the soggy trouts? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why I find that so funny, but... Uh... <clears throat> Despite all these clues, Docs instead, we still have no idea where InGen might be going. The company seemed obviously focused on animals, and they had hired researchers with an interest in the past. Paleobiological paleobiologists, DNA ph ph phylogeneticists, and so on. <clears throat> then, in 1987, InGen bought an obscure company called Millipore Plastic Products in Nashville, Tennessee. This was an agribusiness company that had recently patented a new plastic with the characteristics of an avian eggshell. The plastic could be shaped into an egg and used to grow chicken embryos. Starting the following year, InGen took the entire output of this millipore plastic for its own use. 
Dr. Dogson, this is all very interesting. At the same time, Dogson continued, construction was began on Island New Block. This involved massive earthworks, including a shell. This, invo this involved massive earthworks, in including a shallow lake two miles long in the center of the island. Plans for resort facilities were let out with a high degree of confidentiality, but it appears that Injun has built a private zoo of very large dimensions on this island. <clears throat> One of the directors leaned forward and said, "Dr. Dogson, so what?" Doc Dogson sighed. "It's not an ordinary zoo," he said. This zoo is unique in the world. It seems that InGen have done something quite extraordinary. They have managed to clone extinct animals from the past. What animals? Animals that hatched from eggs that require a lot of room in a zoo. What animals? Dinosaurs, Dogson said. They are cloning dinosaurs. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just trying to find, like, the best angle to read this at. <clears throat> I just want to say once again, I appreciate everyone for watching. The consternation that followed was entirely misplaced in Dogson's view. The trouble with money men was that they didn't keep up they had invested in the field, but they didn't know what was possible. In fact, there had been discussion of cloning dinosaurs in the technical literature as far back as 1982. With each passing year, the manipulation of DNA had grown easier. Genetic material had always been extracted from Egyptian mummies and from the hide of a quagga, a zebra-like African animal that had become extinct in the 1880s. But by 1985, it seemed possible that quagga DNA might be reconstituted and a new animal grown. If so, it would be the first creature brought back from extinction solely by the reconstruction of its DNA. If that was possible, what else was possible? The mastodon, a saber-toothed cat, the dodo, or even a dinosaur? Of course, no dinosaur DNA was known to exist anywhere in the world. But by grinding up a large quantity of dinosaur bones, it might be possible to extract fragments of the DNA. Formerly, it was thought that fossilization eliminated all DNA. Now that we recognize that as untrue, if enough DNA fragments were recovered, it might be possible to clone a living animal. <clears throat> Hi, InGen 2 d Nice to see you in the chat here. Give me some W's for InGen 2 d If you guys haven't already seen it, he's done a, a very cool animation that I collabed with him on. Uh, I did the voiceover, and he did all the animation himself, so definitely go check out his channel. Thanks for joining us this morning, InGen. Or this afternoon, I should say. <clears throat> hey, thank you guys here on TikTok for the follows. Much appreciated, much appreciated. All righty. Uh, back in 1982, the technical problems had seemed daunting, but there was two, but that... But there was no theoretical barrier. It was merely difficult, expensive, and unlikely to work. Yet, it was certainly possible, if anyone cared enough to try. InGen had apparently decided to try. What they have done, Dogson said, is build the greatest single tourist attraction in the history of the world. As you know, zoos are extremely popular. Last year, more Americans visited zoos than all the professional baseball and football games combined, and the Japanese love zoos. There are 50 zoos in Japan and more being built. And for this zoo, InGen can charge whatever they want. $2,000 a day, $10,000 a day. And then there's the merchandising. The picture books, t-shirts, video games, caps, stuffed toys, comic books, and pets. Pets? Of course. InGen can make full-size dinosaurs. They can also make a pygmy dinosaur as household pets. What child wouldn't want a little dinosaur as a pet? A little patented animal for their very own. InGen will sell millions of them, and InGen will engineer them so that pet dinosaurs can only eat InGen pet food. Jesus, somebody said. Exactly, Dachshun said. The zoo is the centerpiece of an enormous enterprise. You said that the dinosaurs will be patented? Yes, genetically engineered animals can now be patented. The Supreme Court ruled on that in favor of Harvard in 1987. InGen will own its dinosaurs, and no one else can legally make them. What prevents us from creating our own dinosaurs? Nothing, except that they have a five-year head start. It'll almost be impossible to catch up before the end of the century. He paused. Of course, if we could obtain examples of their dinosaurs, we could reverse engineer them and make our own, with enough modifications in the DNA to evade their patents. <clears throat> 
Can we obtain examples of their dinosaurs? Dachshund and paused. I believe we can, yes. Somebody cleared his throat. There wouldn't be anything illegal about it. Oh no, Doxon said quickly. Nothing illegal. I'm talking about a legitimate source of their DNA. A disgruntled employee or some trash improperly disposed of. Something like that. Do you have a legitimate source, Doxon? I do, Dogson said, but I'm afraid there is some urgency in that decision because InGen is experiencing a small crisis and my source will have to act within the next 24 hours. A long silence descended over the room. The men looked at the secretary taking notes and the tape recorder on the table in front of her. I don't see the need for a formal resolution on this, Dogson said. Just a sense of the room as to whether you feel I should proceed. Slowly, the heads nodded. Nobody spoke. Nobody went on record. They just nodded silently. Thank you for your com thank you for coming, gentlemen. Dachshund said, "I'll take it from here." So another so just talking about this real quick. Dachshund is obviously trying to set st some stuff up, but it's much more clever than it is in the films, right? Dachshund just shows up, pays an entry to steal the embryos for Biosyn. In the book here, it's much more than that. Dachshund seems to have some sort of vendetta against InGen and will do anything he can to steal from them specifically. Most of his work and everything seems to be mainly focused on InGen for whatever reason. Um, oh, ch thank you for the bits very much, Mocho Choc Mo Chocolate 9K. Thank you very much for the bits. Give me, give me some W's for Mo Chocolate. I'm glad you enjoy the TikToks. Thank you so very much. All righty, all righty, Roo. <clears throat> and uh, everybody here on the TikTok as well, thank you all so very much for being in here, sharing the live and stuff. Body bag? I don't know who that is, but. All righty. Let's. Next chapter is called Airport. And so if you're not already starting to kind of pick up on what's going on, Dogson is obviously setting up just like he did in the uh, in the book or in the film, but in a different way than in the films. Oh, I just got a notification about something. What do we get? Dr. Nightmare, thank you so much for the subscription. Holy cannoli. Give us some major W's for Dr. Nightmare. Thank you so very much for subscribing, and it's very much appreciated. Uh, it your boy, how do I see through the mask? I see through this part right here. This is like, I don't know if you noticed, especially you on TikTok, you can kind of see through the mask with this light shining on. Um, so I'm not entirely like, I, I'm not blind. You know what I'm saying? I can still see through here. <clears throat> Anywho. Oh man, I didn't change any of my tags here on Twitch. Whoops. My mistake. But anyways, one more time. Give me some W's for Dr. Nightmare. Thank you so much once again for the subscription, my guy. This next chapter is called Airport. And again, this one continues with Dogson. Louis Dogson entered the coffee shop in the departure building of San Francisco Airport and looked around quickly. His man was already there, waiting at the counter. Dogson sat down next to him and placed the briefcase on the floor between them. You're late, pal, the man said. He looked at the straw hat Dogson was wearing and laughed. What is this supposed to be, a disguise? You never know, Dogson said, suppressing his anger. For six months, Dogson had patiently cultivated this man, who had grown more obnoxious with each meeting. But there was nothing Dogson could do about that. Both men knew exactly what the stakes were. Bioengineered DNA was, wait for wait, the most ma valuable material in the world. A single microscopic bacterium, too small to see with his naked eye, but containing the genes for a heart attack enzyme, strepto tokenize or for ice minus which prevented which prevented frost damage to crops might be worth five billion dollars to the right buyer <clears throat> <coughs> sorry for fumbling over my words there a bit folks and the fact of life had and that fact of life had created a bizarre new world of industrial espionage Dodson was especially skilled at it in 1987, he convinced a disgruntled geneticist to quit Cetus for Biosyn and take five strains of engineered bacteria with her. The geneticist simply put a drop of it on each of her fingernails of one hand and walked out the door. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Twitch had some ads. YouTube does have some ads too. I will give you a fair warning. Um...
Cedric, thank you very much for the subscription on tick on YouTube. Much appreciated. I appreciate every single one of you folks for watching, though, whether you're on Twitch, TikTok, or YouTube. All of you guys, I appreciate you. <clears throat> All right, where were we at? But InGen presented a tougher challenge. Dogson wanted more than bacterial DNA. He wanted frozen embryos, and he knew InGen guarded its embryos with the most elaborate security measures. To obtain them, he needed an InGen employee who had access to the embryos, who was willing to steal them, and who could defeat the security. Such a person was not easy to find. Dogson had finally located a, a susceptible InGen employee earlier in the year. Although this particular person had no access to genetic material, Dachshund kept up contact, meeting the man monthly at Carlos and Charlie's in Silicon Valley, hope, helping him in small ways. And now that InGen was inviting con contractors and advisors to visit the island, this was the moment that Dachshund had been waiting for, because it meant he would have access to the embryos. Let's get down to it, the man said. I've got ten minutes before my flight. You want to go over it again? Dachshund said. Nah, Dr. Dachshund. I want to see the damn money. Dachshund flipped the latch on the briefcase and opened it a few inches. The man glanced down casually. That's all of it? That's half of it. $750,000. Okay, fine. The man turned away, drank his coffee. That's fine, Dr. Dogson. Dogson quickly locked the briefcase. That's for all 15 species, you remember. I remember. 15 species, frozen embryos. How am I going to transport them? Dogson handed, a can, handed the man a large can of Gillette foamy shaving cream. That's it? That's it? They may check my luggage. Dachshund shrugged. Press the top, he said. The man pressed it, and white shaving cream puffed into his hand. Not bad. He wiped the foam off at the edge of his plate. Not bad. The can's a little heavier than usual, is all. Dachshund's technical team had been assembling it around the clock for the last two days. Quickly, he showed him how it worked. How much cooling gas is inside? Enough for 36 hours. The embryos have to be back in San Jose by then. That's up to your guy on the boat, the man said. Better make sure he has a portable cooler on board. I'll do that, Dachshun said. And uh, let's just review the bidding. The deal is the same, Dachshun said. 50000 on delivery of each embryo. If they're viable, an additional 50000 each. That's fine. Just make sure you have the boat waiting at the end of the dock on the island, Friday night. Not the north dock where the big supply boats arrive. The east dock. It's a small utility dock. You got that? I got it, Dachshun said. When will you be back in San Jose? Probably Sunday. The man pushed away from the counter. Dogson frowned. You're sure you know how to work the... I know, the man said. Believe me, I know. Also, Dogson said, we think that the island maintains constant radio c contact with InGen, InGen corporate headquarters in California. So, look, I've got it covered, the man said. Just relax and get the money ready. I want it all Sunday morning in San Jose Airport in cash. I'll be waiting for you, Dogson said. Don't worry. So, obviously, that was the Nedry scene from the book, or from the films, obviously, just cha it's slightly different here in the books. They don't say Nedry's name, they don't reveal exactly who's working for Dachshun, but it's pretty clear, especially once you start to get into Nedry's chapters yourself. <clears throat> I apologize for the ads, folks. I, I know it's not necessarily ideal. Um, I hope you guys can bear with me. <laughs> exactly, Dinorama. But that's not for a little while. That's not for a little while. Alrighty. The next chapter, many of you may enjoy this. This next chapter is called Malcolm. Shortly before midnight, he stepped on the plane at Dallas Airport. A tall, thin, balding man of 35, dressed entirely in black. Black shirt, black trousers, black socks, black sneakers. Ah, Dr. Malcolm, Hammond said, smiling with forced, gratu forced graciousness. Malcolm grinned. Hello, John. Yes, I am afraid your old nemesis is here. Malcolm shook hands with everyone, saying quickly, Ian Malcolm, how do you do? I do maths. He struck Grant as being more amused by the outing than anything else. Certainly, Grant recognized his name. Ian Malcolm was one of the most famous of the new generation of mathematicians who were openly interested in how the real world works. These scholars broke with the cloister tradition of mathematics in several important ways. For one thing, they used computers constantly, a practice traditional mathematics frowned on. 
For another, they, were almost, they worked almost exclusively with nonlinear equations in the emerging field called chaos theory. For a third, they appeared to care that their mathematics described something that actually existed in the real world. And finally, as if to emphasize their emergence from the academia into the real world, they dressed and spoke with what, with what one senior mathematician called a deplorable excess of personality. In fact, they often behaved like rock stars. And so that's why Malcolm's like character is the way he is in the movie, because it's based off of this description, which is a pretty apt description of Malcolm's character, if I do say so myself. So now I'm all right with it. <clears throat> Malcolm sat in one of the padded chairs. The stewardom asked us if he wanted a drink, and he said, Diet Coke, shaken, not stirred. Humid Dallas air drifted through the open door, and Ellie said, Isn't it a little warm for black? You're extremely pretty, Dr. Sadler, he said. I could look at your legs all day. But no, as a matter of fact, black is an excellent color for heat. If you remember, your, bo your black body radiation, black is actually best in heat. E efficient radiation. In any case, I wear only two colors, black and gray. Ellie was just staring at him, mouth open. And again, here's a little more of what I meant by the uh, a little uh, sexism in the book, but that's, it happens, it happens. Especially in the scientific field back in the day. I'm not excusing it by any means, and it's not okay, but it did happen. Though I will say, Ellie makes them all regret their sexism. Trust you me. Um, Ellie was staring at him, her mouth open. These colors are appropriate for any occasion, Malcolm continued. And they, and they go well together, should I mistakenly put on a pair of gray socks with my black trousers. But don't you fi find it boring to wear only two colors? Not at all. I find it liberating. I believe, my li I believe my life has value, and I don't want to waste it thinking about clothing, Malcolm said. I don't want to think about what I, what I will wear in the morning. Truly, can you imagine anything more boring than fashion? Professional sports, perhaps. Grown men swatting little balls while the rest of the world pays money to applaud. But on the whole, I find fashion even more tedious than sports. Dr. Malcolm, Hammond explained, is a man of strong opinions. And mad as a hatter, Malcolm said cheerfully. But you must admit, they are, these are non-trivial issues. We live in a world of frightful givens. It is given that you will behave like this, given that you will care about that. No one thinks about the givens. Isn't it amazing? In the information society, nobody thinks. We're expected to ban it. We expected to banish paper, but we actually banish thought. Hammond turned to Gennaro and raised his hands. You invited him. And a lucky thing too, Malcolm said, because it sounds as if you have a serious problem. We have no problems, Hammond said quickly. I always maintained, the, I, I always maintained this island would be unworkable, Malcolm said. I predicted it from the beginning. He reached into a soft leather briefca briefcase. And I trust by now that we all know the eventual outcome is going to be. You're going to have to shut the thing down. Shut it down, Hammond said angrily. This is ridiculous. Malcolm shrugged, indifferent to Hammond's outburst. I brought copies of my original paper for you to look at, he said. The original consultancy paper I did for InGen. Mathematics are a bit sticky, but I can walk you through it. You leaving now? I have some phone calls to make, Hammond said, and went into the adjoining cabin. Well, it's a long flight, Malcolm said. At least my paper will give you something to do. And so that transitions to, obviously, this is Malcolm's first, like, actual introduction in the book. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone who's still watching. Much appreciated, much appreciated. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I, can, I mean, I can show you a little bit of the inside of the book as well, but... Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm not doing a face reveal or anything. You might see my beard or something when I go scratch a little bit, but that's about it. And thank you to those of you who are saying respect my anonymity. I appreciate that very much. I try to be anonymous for the most part, but, you know... <clears throat> the plane flew through the night. Grant knew that Ian Malcolm had his share of detractors, and he could understand why some found his style too abrasive, and his applications of chaos theory too glib. Grant thumbed through the paper, glancing at equations. Gennaro said, your paper concludes that Hammond's Island is bound to fail? Correct. Because of chaos theory. Correct. To be more precise, because of the behavior of the system in phase space. Gennaro tossed the paper aside and said, can you explain this in English? Surely, Malcolm said. Let's see where we have to start. You know what a nonlinear equation is? No. Strange attractors? No. All right, Malcolm said. Let's go back to the beginning. He paused, staring at the ceiling. Physics has had a great success at describing certain kinds of behavior, 
planets in orbits, spacecraft going to the moon, pendulums and springs and rolling balls, that sort of thing. The regular movements of objects. They are described by what we call linear equations, and mathematics and mathematicians can solve those equations easily. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. Okay, Gennaro said. But there's another kind of behavior which physics handles badly. For example, anything to do with turbulence, water coming out of a spout, air moving over an airplane wing, wing weather, blood flowing through the heart, turbulent events are described by nonlinear equations. They're hard to solve. In fact, they're usually impossible to solve. So physics has never understood this whole class of events until about 10 years ago. The new theory that describes them is called chaos theory. Chaos theory originally grew out of attempts to make computer models of weather in the 1960s. Weather is a big, complicated system, namely the Earth's atmosphere as it interacts with the land and the sun. The behavior of this big, complicated system was always, defined, under, always defied understanding, so naturally we couldn't predict weather. But what the early researchers learned from computer models was that even if you understood it, you still couldn't predict it. Weather prediction is absolutely impossible. The reason is that the behavior of the system is sensitivity dependent on initial conditions. You lost me, Gennaro said. If, you, if I use a cannon to fire a shell of a certain weight at a certain speed and at a certain angle of, of inclination, and then if I fire a second shell with almost the exact same weight, speed, and angle, what will happen? The two shells will land at almost the exact same spot. Right, that's linear dynamics. Okay, but if I have a weather system that I start up with a certain temperature and a certain wind speed and a certain humidity, and if I then repeat it with almost the same temperature, wind, and humidity, the second system will not behave the same. It'll wander off and rapidly will become very different from the first. Thunderstorms instead of sunshine. That's nonlinear dynamics. They are sensitive to initial conditions, dif tiny differences because of amplified. Tiny differences become amplified. I think I see, Gennaro said. <clears throat> the shorthand is the butterfly effect. The butterfly flaps its wings in pecking and the weather in New York is different. So chaos is all just random and unpredictable? Is that it? No, Malcolm said. We actually find hidden regularities within the complex variety of a system's behavior. That's why chaos has now become a very broad theory that's used to study everything from the stock market to rioting crowds to brain waves during epilepsy. Any sort of complex system where there is confusion and unpredictability, we can find underlying order. Okay? Okay. But what is this underlying order? It's essentially characterized by the movement of the system within phase space. Jesus, Gennaro said. All I wanted to know is why you think Hammond's Island can't work. I understand, Malcolm said, and I'll get there. Chaos theory says two things. First, the complex systems like weather have an underlying order. Second, the reverse of that, this, that simple systems can produce complex behavior. For example, pool balls. You hit a pool ball and it starts to karam off the sides of the table. In theory, that's a fairly simple system, almost a Newtonian system. Since you can know the force imparted on the ball and the mass of the ball, you can calculate the angles at which it will strike the walls, and you can predict the future behavior of the ball. In theory, you could predict the behavior of the ball far into the future as it keeps bouncing from side to side. You could predict where it will end up in three hours from now, in theory. Okay, Gennaro nodded. But, in fact, Malcolm said, it turns out you can't predict more than a few seconds into the future, because almost immediately very small effects, imperfections in the surface of the ball, tiny indentations on the wood of the table, start to make a difference, and it doesn't take long before they overpower your careful calculations. So it turns out that this simple system of a pool ball on a table has unpredictable behavior. Okay. And Hammond's project, Malcolm said, is another apparently simple system, animals within a zoo environment, that will eventually show unpredictable behavior. You know this because of theory, Malcolm said. But you had bet but hadn't you better see the island to see what he's actually done? No, that's quite unnecessary. The details don't matter. De theory tells me that theory tells me that the island will cr quickly proceed to behave in unpredictable fashions. And you're confident in your theory. Oh yes, Malcolm said. Totally confident. He sat back in the chair. There is a problem with the island. It's an accident waiting to happen. <clears throat> We're going to take a pause for just a moment so I can grab a sip of water and whatnot. Just give me one second here, folks. I will still be here, though. So...
Can you folks hear me now? Can you folks hear me now? Hello, testing one, two, three, one, two, three. Can you hear me? Crimson says he can hear me. Just making sure, just wanna be sure. Adams, you can hear me? Okay, cool. No audio. Jose says he can hear me now. Okay, perfect, perfect. Just making sure, just making sure. I just want to be sure you guys can still hear me so we can still discuss this. You know, I want to be able to uh, to chat with y'all folks. Everybody here in the uh, TikTok, thank you all for sending some roses and whatnot. Much appreciated. Who Do we got anyone in the chat right now? Any of our buddies in the chat? <clears throat> oh, man. It gets hot in that mask, guys. I tell you what. All right. Sounds good, uh, Dr. Nightmare Crimson. It's your boy, Master Key. Just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Even when I'm, you know, taking a pause for a second. All righty, folks. Live chat. I don't know why it's not putting me in live chat automatically. It had me in uh, the, uh, the non-live for whatever reason. I know you folks can't see me because I took off my mask for a second, so I'm just... Taking a breath. How's everybody doing today? You guys enjoying your Saturday so far? Having a good day? I hope you're having a good day. Everybody over on the uh, TikTok who's hopping in, thank you all so very much for joining me. AI Golf Club, that's an interesting ad. Oh, it's your first day of spring break? Well, congratulations, Crimson. I hope you enjoy the rest of your spring break. I remember when I was in school and got spring break. Man, I miss those days. I'm glad to hear everybody's having a good time. Oh, you're playing Mario Kart. That's always fun. Yeah, we're, we're still going to go for a few hours here, too. So we got a lot of time. Got a lot of time. All righty. Give me just a second here. And I will get back in the mask and we can continue on. Hello to everybody joining me, and hello to every, er, and goodbye to everybody leaving. Hello once again to my TikTok chat. I am back. Uh, Tom, I'm glad to have introduced you to that D&D &D book. Um, guys, if you haven't already seen it, make sure you check out my video that I just recently made about the new Dungeons & Dragons expansion that involves dinosaurs. I highly recommend it. It's called Dr. Drolin's Dictionary of Dinosaurs. I made a whole video breaking down some of the basic basics of the book. Otherwise, I just highly recommend picking one up. It is an amazing book, and I can't wait to use it for my next D&D campaign. <clears throat> Alrighty. Let us get back to it. Just making sure everything's appearing good. Alright, alright. I did miss you, casual guy. Thanks for coming back. Photography with your Hammond figure collections. That's pretty cool. I don't have any of the Hammond collection yet, but uh, they, they are pretty pretty neat. Alrighty. Me too. Don't get me wrong. I, that, I think, though, that if this book is a success, they will be making another book with, again, more dinosaurs. So I think it's definitely worth it. If you pick this book up, obviously it's telling them that there is a demand for this sort of thing. So if you want more, if you want that kind of stuff, support that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Um... And once again, everybody here from TikTok, Twitch, and YouTube, I appreciate you all so very much. Thank you for watching, and without further ado, let's continue. With a whine, the rotors began to swing in circles overhead, casting shadows on the runway at San Jose Airport. Grand listened to the crackle of, in his headphones as, as the pilot talked to the tower. They had picked up another passenger in San Jose, a man named Dennis Nedry, who had flown in to meet them. 
He was fat and sloppy, eating a candy bar, and there was sticky chocolate on his fingers and flecks of aluminum foil in his t-shirt. Nedry had mumbled something about doing computers on the island and hadn't offered to shake hands. Through the plexi bubble, Grant watched the airport concrete drop away beneath his feet, and he saw the shadow of the helicopter racing as they went west toward the mountains. It's about a 40-minute trip, Hammond said from one of the main seats. Grant watched the low hills rise up, and then they were passing through intermittent clouds, breaking out into the sunshine. The mountains were rugged, though he was surprised at the amount of deforestation. Acre after acre, denuded, eroded hills. Costa Rica, Hammond said has better population control than the other countries in Central America. But even so, the land is badly de deforested, most of this within the last 10 years. Um, pausing this real quick, this might have been true at the time, and I'm not positive, but I will say these days Costa Rica is much more conscious of its just ecological impact and its importance in the ecological just system. Um, and that deforestation is a lot less relevant in Costa Rica specifically, just because tourism is a big part of their income there. And without it, they, they'd be screwed. <clears throat> and I mean, hey, if that's, if that's what it takes for them to keep animals alive, that, that's what it takes sometimes, you know? Um, alrighty. There's better population control, blah, blah, blah. They came down out of the clouds on the other side of the mountains, and Grant saw beaches of the, off the west coast. They flashed over a small coastal village. Bahia Anasco, the pilot said. Fishing village. He pointed north. Up there, up the coast, you can see the Cabo Blanco Preserve. They have beautiful beaches. The pilot headed straight out over the seas. The water turned green and, the deep, and then deep aquamarine. The sun shone on the water. It was about 10 in the morning. Just a few minutes now, and we should be seeing Isla Nublar. Isla Nublar, Hammond, expl Isla Nublar, Hammond explained, was not a true island. Rather, it was a sea mount, a volcanic upthrusting of rock from the ocean floor. Its volcanic origins can be seen all over the island, Hammond said. There are steam vents in many places, and the ground is often hot underfoot. Because of this, and also because of prevailing currents, Isla Nubar lies in a sort of foggy area. As we get there, you will see, ah, there we are. The helicopter rushed forward, low to the water, and ahead Grant saw an island, rugged, craggy, and rising sharply from the ocean. Christ, it looks like Alcatraz, Malcolm said. Its forested slopes were wreathed in fog, giving the island a mysterious appearance. Much larger, of course, Hammond said. Eight miles long and three miles wide at the widest point, and a total some 22 square miles, making it the largest private animal preserve in North America. The helicopter began to climb and headed towards the north end of the island. Grant was trying to see through the dense fog. It's not usually this thick, Hammond said. He sounded a bit worried. <clears throat> Hey, I mean, I'm always interested in seeing fan art, Tyrannosaurus Rex. I've never actually, you know, seen fan art before, so that'd be that'd be interesting. Uh, oh, you're writing your own Jurassic Park novel. That'd be interesting. I'm always interested in fan projects because, I mean, I'm essentially a fan project myself, so. Um, at the north end of the island, the hills were highest, rising more than 2,000 feet above the ocean. The tops of the hills were in fog, but Grant saw rugged cliffs and crashing ocean below. The helicopters climbed above the hills. Unfortunately, Hammond said, we have a lot on we we have to land on the island. I don't like to do it because it disturbs the animals, and if it's sometimes a, and it's sometimes a bit thrilling. Hammond's voice cut off as the pilot said, Starting our descent now. Hang on, folks. The helicopter started down and immediately they were blanketed in fog. Grant heard a repetitive electronic beeping through his earphones, but he could see nothing at all, and then he began dimly to discern the green branches of pine trees reaching through the mist. Some of the branches were very close. <clears throat> How the hell is he doing this, Malcolm said, but nobody answered. The pilot swung his gaze left, then right, looking at the pine forest. The trees were still close. The helicopters were still descending rapidly. Jesus, Malcolm said. The beeping was louder. Grant looked at the pilot. He was concentrating. Grant looked down and saw a giant glowing fluorescent cross beneath the plexi bubble at his feet. There were flashing lights at the corners of the cross. The pilot corrected slightly and touched down on a helipad. The sound of the rotors faded and died. Grant sighed and released his seatbelt. We have to come down fast that way, Hammond said, because of the wind shear. There's often bad wind shears on this peak, and, well, we're safe. 
Someone was running up to the helicopter, a man with a baseball cap and red hair. He threw open the doors and said cheerfully, Hi, I'm Ed Rikas. Welcome to Isla Nublar, everybody, and watch your step, please. A narrow path wound down the hill. The air was chilly and damp as they moved lower, and the mist around them thinned, and Grant could see the landscape better. It looked, he thought, rather like the Pacific Northwest, the Olympic, Pen the Olympic Peninsula. That's right, Regis said. Primary ecology is deciduous rainforest, rather, rather different from the vegetation on the mainland, which is more classical rainforest. But this is a microclimate that only occurs at elevation on the slopes of northern hills. The majority of this island is tropical. Down below, they could see the white roofs of larger buildings, nestled among the planting. Grant was surprised. The construction was elaborate. They moved lower out of the mist, and now he could see a full extent of the island stretching away to the south. As Regis had said, it was mostly covered in tropical forest. To the south, rising above the palm trees, Grant saw a single trunk with no leaves at all, just a big, curving stump. Then the stump moved and twisted around to face the new arrivals, and Grant realized he wasn't seeing a trunk at all. He was looking at the graceful, curving neck of an enormous creature, rising 50 feet into the air. He was looking at a dinosaur. My God, this next chapter is called Welcome. And obviously, this is the part in, in, the, not, or in the film where they show up to the island and see the dinosaurs for the first time. It just goes a little faster. There's not the whole scene where Hammond's going, stop, 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 stop. <clears throat> All right, next chapter is called Welcome. My God, Ellie said softly. They were all staring at the animal above the trees. My God. Her first thought was that the dinosaur was extraordinarily beautiful. Books portrayed them as oversized, dumpy creatures, but this long-necked animal had a gracefulness, almost a dignity about its movements. And it was quick. There was nothing lumbering or dull about its behavior. The sauropod peered alertly at them and made a low trumpeting sound, rather like an elephant. A moment later, a second head rose above the foliage, and then a third and a fourth. My God, Ellie said again. <clears throat> Gennaro was speechless. He had known all along what to expect. He had known about it for years, but he had somehow never believed it would happen, and now he was shocked into silence. The awesome power of new genetic technology, which he had formerly considered to be just so many words in an overwrought sales pitch, the power suddenly became clear to him. These animals were so big. They were enormous, as big as a house, and so many of them, actual damn dinosaurs just as real as you could want. Gennaro thought, we're going to make a fortune off this place. A fortune. He hoped, to God, he hoped to God the island was safe. Grant stood on the path on the side of the hill, with the, with the mist on his face staring at the gray necks coming above the palms. He felt dizzy, as if the ground was slipping away too steeply. He had trouble getting his breath, because he was looking at something he had never expected to see in his life, and yet he was seeing it. The animals in the mist were perfect apatosaurs, medium-sized sauropods. Oop. His stunned mind made academic associations, North, Ameri North American herbivores, late Jurassic Horizon, commonly called, Bron commonly called Brontosaurus. Pause here real quick. So at this point in time, um, uh, Brontosaurus had been deemed a invalid species, I believe. So, Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus were thought to be the same creatures. But nowadays, as of 2015, we know that they are, in fact, separate species. Commonly called Brontosaurus, first discovered by E.D. Cope in Montana in 1876. Specimens associated with the Morrison Formation strata in Colorado, Utah, and Oklahoma. Recently, Berman and McIntosh had reclassified it as a Diplodocus, based on skull appearance. Traditionally, Brontosaurus was thought to spend most of its time in shallow water, which would help support its bulk. Although this animal was clearly not in the water, it was moving much too quickly, the head and neck shifting above the palms in a very active manner. A surprisingly active manner. And Grant began to laugh. What is it? Hammond said, worrying. Is something wrong? Grant just shook his head and continued to laugh. He couldn't tell them that what was funny was that he had seen this animal for only a few seconds, but he had already begun to accept it and to use his observations to answer long-standing questions in the field. He was still laughing as he saw the fifth and sixth neck crane up above the palm trees. The sauropod watched the people arrived. 
They reminded Grant of oversized giraffes. They had the, sp the same pleasant, rather stupid gaze. I take it they're not animatronics, Malcolm said. They're very lifelike. Yes, they certainly are, Hammond said. Well, they should be, shouldn't they? From the distance, they heard the trumpeting sound again. First one animal made it, and then the other, and then others joined in. That's their call, Rodriguez said, welcoming us to the island. Grant stood and listened for a moment, entranced. You probably want to know what happens next, Hammond was saying, continuing down the path. We've scheduled a complete tour of the facilities for you, and a trip to see the dinosaurs in the park later this afternoon. I'll be joining you for dinner, and will answer any remaining questions you may have then. Now, if you'll go with Mr. Regis... The group followed Ed Regis towards the nearest building. Over the path, a crude, hand-painted sign read, Welcome to Jurassic Park. Um, and so, that's the end of that chapter. And that starts the third iteration, right? So, I mentioned this before. Each This book is broken down, I believe, into seven iterations, quote-unquote, with more chaos unfolding at each. And the point of these is just to kind of show us that Malcolm is making these predictions as the book goes along. So this third iteration, it says, details emerge more clearly as the fractal curve is redrawn. Kind of branching into his chaos theory that he was talking about previously. <laughs> exactly. Journey to the island is exact. That's what I went into my mind. <clears throat> All right, back to it. Hey, and everybody in in here on the TikTok, thank you all so very much for joining me. I know this, I haven't done a live TikTok in a while, but I appreciate it. This next chapter is titled Jurassic Park, the first chapter of the third iteration. They moved into a green tunnel tunnel of overarching palms leading towards the main visitor building. Everywhere, extensive and elaborate planting emphasized the feeling that they were entering a new world, a prehistoric tropical world, and leaving the normal world behind. Ellie said to Grant, they look pretty good. Yeah, yes, Grant said. I want to see them up close. I want to lift up their toe pads and expect their claws and feel their skin and open their jaws and have a look at their teeth. Until then, I don't know for sure, but yeah, they look good. I suppose it changes your field a bit, Malcolm said. Grant shook his head. It changes everything, he said. For 150 years, ever since the discovery of gigantic animal bones in Europe, the study of dinosaurs had been an, ex an exercise in scientific deductions. Paleontology was essentially detective work, searching for clues in the fossil bones and the trackways of long-vanished giants. The best paleontologists were the ones who could make the most clever deductions. And, at all, and all the great disputes of paleontology were carried out in this fashion, including the bitter debate in which Grant was a key figure about whether dinosaurs were warm-blooded. So again, this book was at a time where we weren't positive if, di if dinosaurs were warm-blooded or cold-blooded or what. Um, but it was the start, basically, of the dinosaur revolution, which was kind of like, or not the dinosaur revolution, the dinosaur renaissance, which started by Backer and Ostrom after the discovery of Deinonychus. So this was like the first piece of media that really exemplified this. <clears throat> um, in which Grant was a key figure about whether dinosaurs were warm-blooded. Scientists had always classified dinosaurs as reptiles, cold-blooded creatures drawing the heat they needed for, for life from the environment. A mammal could metabolize food to produce bodily warmth, but a reptile could not. Eventually, a handful of researchers led chief... Oh, hey, here we're talking about this right now. Eventually, a handful of researchers, led chiefly by John Ostrom and Robert Baker at Yale, began to suspect that the concept of sluggish, cold-blooded dinosaurs was inadequate. Was inadequate to explain the fossil record. In class of deductive fashion, they drew conclusions from several lines of evidence. First was posture. Lizards and reptiles were bent-legged sprawlers, hugging the ground for warmth. Lizards didn't have the energy to stand on their hind legs for more than a few seconds, but the dinosaurs stood on straight legs, and many walked erect on their hind legs. Among living animals, erect posture occurred only in warm-blooded mammals and birds, and the dinosaurs' posture suggested warm-bloodedness. Next, they studied metabolism, calculating the pressure necessary to push blood up the 18-foot-long neck of a brachiosaur, and concluded that could only be accomplished by a four-chambered, hot-blooded heart. They studied trackways, fossil footprints left in the mud, and concluded that dinosaurs ran as fast as a man. Much such activity implied warm blood. They, f 
They found dinosaur remains above the Arctic Circle in a, in a frigid environment unimaginable for a reptile. And the new studies of group behavior, based largely on Grant's own work, suggested that dinosaurs had complex social life and reared their young as reptiles did. Crocodiles and turtles abandoned their eggs, but dinosaurs probably didn't. Um, another thing here that like Grant kind of made... So, you, you guys might not know this, but Grant is actually kind of a sit-in for paleontologist Jack Horner. And obviously, you know, Jack Horner's been controversial, this, that, the other thing, but overall, that's who he's meant to represent. He, all the Egg Mountain and everything, that is him in the book. <clears throat> um, the warm-blooded controversy had raged for 15 years before a new perception of dinosaurs as quick-moving, active animals was accepted but not without the lasting animosities. At conventions, there were still colleagues who did not speak to one another. But now, if dinosaurs could be cloned, why, Grant's field of study was going to change instantly. The paleontological study of dinosaurs was finished. The whole enterprise, the museum's halls with their great giant skeletons and flocks of echoing schoolchildren, the university laboratories with their bone trays, the research papers, the journals, all of it was going to end. You don't seem upset, Malcolm said. Grant shook his head. It's been discussed in the field. Many people imagined it was coming, just not so soon. Story of our species, Malcolm said, laughing. Everybody knows it's coming, but not so soon. As they walked down the path, they could no longer see the dinosaurs, but they could hear them, trumpeting softly in the distance. My only question is, Grant said, where they get the DNA? Grant was aware of serious speculation in laboratories in Berkeley, Tokyo, and London that it might eventually be possible to clone an extinct animal such as a dinosaur if you could get some dinosaur DNA to work with. The problem was that all known dinosaurs were fossils, and the fossilization destroyed most DNA, replacing it with inorganic material. Of course, if a dinosaur was frozen or preserved in a peat bog or mummified in a desert environment, then its DNA might be recoverable. <clears throat> But nobody had ever found a frozen or mummified dinosaur, so cloning was therefore impossible, and there was nothing to clone from. All the modern genetic technology was useless. It was like having a Xerox copier, but nothing to copy with it. Ellie said, you can't reproduce a real dinosaur because you don't... because you can't get real dinosaur DNA. Unless there's a way we haven't thought of, Grant said. Like what? I don't know. Beyond a fence, they came to the swimming pool, which spilled over into a series of waterfalls and smaller rocky pools. The area was planted with huge ferns. Isn't this extraordinary, Ed Riga said, especially on, the, especially on a misty day. These plants really contribute to the prehistoric atmosphere. These are authentic Jurassic ferns, of course. Ellie paused and looked more closely at the ferns. Yes, it was just as he said. Serrana veriformans, a, a plant found abundantly in fossils more than 200 million years old, now common only in the wetlands of Brazil and Colombia. But whoever had decided to place this particular fern at poolside obviously didn't know that the spores of veriformans con contained a deadly beta-carboline beta alkaloid. Even touching the attractive green fronds could make you sick, and if a child were to take a mouthful, he would almost certainly die. The toxin was 50 times more poisonous than oleander. <clears throat> People were so naive about plants, Ellie thought. They just chose plants for appearance, as they would choose a picture for the wall. It never occurred to them that the plants were actually living things, busily performing all the living functions of respiration, ingestion, excretion, and reproduction, and defense. But Ellie knew, in the Earth's history, plants had evolved as competitively as animals, and in some ways, more fiercely. The poison in Serrano veriformans was a minor example of the elaborate chemical arsenal that wet and weapons that plants had evolved. There were terpenes, which plants spread to poison the soil, to poison the soil around them and, hip, and inhibit comp competitors. Alkaloids, which made them unpalatable to insects and predators and children, and the pheromones for, used for communication. When a Douglas fir tree was attacked by beetles, it produced an anti-feeding chemical, and so did others. Douglas firs in distant parts of the forest. It happened in response to warning alleochemicals secreted by the trees that were under attack. People who imagined that life on Earth consisted of animals moving against a green background seriously misunderstood what they were seeing. That green background was busily alive. Plants grew, moved, twisted, turned, fighting for, fighting for the sun, and they interacted continuously with the animals, discouraging some with bark and thorns, poisoning others, and feeding still others to advance their own reproduction, to spread their pollen and seeds. And it was a complex, dynamic process which she never which she never ceased to find fascinating, and which she knew most people simply didn't understand. 
But if planting deadly ferns at poolside was any indication, then it was clear that the designers of Jurassic Park had not been as careful as they should have been. Isn't it just wonderful, Edrigus was saying? If you look ahead, you'll see our safari lodge. Ellie saw a dramatic low building with a series of glass pyramids on the roof. That's where you'll all be staying, here in Jurassic Park. <clears throat> uh, I've made quite a few videos on the Mosasaurs before, so I, I hope you've watched those. Oh, the Buggy, thank you very much. Oh, wow, we've got a lot of subscribers, actually, recently. Thank you all very much for watching the Buggy, Superior, Hewo, Josh Ramey. Is there anybody else? Did I miss anybody? I don't think so. All right. Thank you all for subscribing. Much appreciated. It didn't give me any notification for whatever reason. Maybe my headset's dead. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, my headset was in fact dead. Whoops. That's my bad, folks. Could not hear what was going on. <clears throat> Kentucky Fried Comsognathus. Now, I don't know about that, sir. Alrighty. Getting back into this here. Um, Grant's suite was done in beige tones. The rattan furniture and green jungle print motifs. The room wasn't quite finished, and there were stacks of lumber in the closet and pieces of electrical conduit on the floor. There was a television set in the corner with a card on top. Channel 2, his... Channel 2, Hypsphilodont Highlands. Channel 3, Triceratops Territory. Channel 4, Sauropod Swamp. Channel 5, Carnivore Country. Channel 6, Stegosaurus South. Chap Channel 7, Velociraptor Valley. Channel 8, Pterosaur Peak. He found the names irritatingly cute. Grant turned on the television, but only got static. He shut it off and went to his... Oh, dear. He shut it off and went to his bedroom, tossed his suitcase on the bed... Directly over the bed was a large py pyramidal skylight. It created a tented feeling, like sleeping under the stars. Unfortunately, the glass had, been, had to be protected by heavy bars, so the striped shadows fell across his bed. Grant paused. He had seen the plans for the lodge, but he didn't remember bars on the skylight. In fact, these bars appeared to be a rather crude addition. A black steel frame had been constructed outside the glass walls, and the bars welded to the frame. Puzzled, Grant moved from the bedroom to the living room. His window looked out onto the swimming pool. By the way, the ferns are poisonous, Ellie said, walking into his room. But did you notice anything about the rooms, Alan? Yeah, they changed the plans. I think so, too, yes, she moved around the room. The windows are small, and the glass is tempered, set in a steel frame. The doors are steel-clad. That shouldn't be necessary. And did you see the fence when we came in? Grant nodded. The entire lodge was enclosed within a fence, with bars of inch-thick steel. The fence was gracefully landscaped and painted flat black to resemble wrought iron, but no cosmetic effect could be distinct could disguise the thickness of the metal or its 12-foot height. I don't think that the fence was in the plans either. It looks for, to me like we've been, like they've turned this place into a fortress. Grant looked at his watch. We'll be sure to ask why. The tour starts in 20 minutes. <clears throat> yes, Endsblade, this is indeed the novel. So, obviously, this is the start of where Grant begins to get suspicious of, like, what's going on. I mean, he's been kind of suspicious ever since Morris came to visit him in the last part. But, again, suspicion begins to grow. Things begin to not make sense to Grant, necessarily. Red Raptors Gourmet Burgers. <laughs> That's an interesting one. Jake Black, thank you for following on Twitch. Much appreciated. Alrighty. Let's continue this show. You guys aren't getting, um, out of curiosity, you got it, you, you're only getting one, um, one audio on YouTube, right? You're not getting, like, multiple audios or anything? Just give me a one if you're hearing me fine on YouTube. Give me a two if you're hearing me poorly on YouTube. And same with you on Twitch, I suppose. I just want to make sure that I'm sounding good to you folks.
I'm sorry, did I say one was a good thing or one was a bad thing? Anime chick, you going a little nuts there, bro. Okay, just making sure. It seems like everyone's saying I'm sounding good, so just needed to make sure, just needed to make sure. Jake, thanks for letting me know. <clears throat> All right. All right, all right, all right. Oh, got a little notification that time. Das Newt, thank you for subscribing. Much appreciated. So this next chapter is called When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth. They met in the visitor building, two stories high, and all glass walls with exposed black anodized girders and supports. Grant found it all determinately high tech. There was a small do auditorium dominated by a robot Tyrannosaurus Rex, poised menacingly by the entrance to an exhibit labeled When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth. Farther on were displays What is a Dinosaur and The Mesozoic World, but the exhibits weren't completed and there were wires and cables all over the floors. Denaro climbed onto the stage and talked to Grant, Ellie, and Malcolm, his voice echoing slightly in the room. Hammond sat back, his hands folded across his chest. Huh? All right, just making sure. I don't know. There's a lot of messages going on in the chat. I'm, I'm just not sure what they're talking about. What's happening right now in the book is they're about to start the tour. That's what's going on in the book. <clears throat> We're about to tour the facilities, Gennaro said. I'm sure Mr. Hammond and his staff will show everything in the best light. Before we go, I wanted to review why we are here and what I need to decide before we leave. Basically, as you all realize by now, this is an island in which genetically engineered dinosaurs have been allowed to move in a natural park-like setting, forming a tourist attraction. The attraction isn't open to tourists yet, but it will be in about a year. Now, my question for you is a simple one. Is this island safe? Is it safe for visitors? And is it safely containing the dinosaurs? Gennaro turned towards the room lights. There are two pieces of evidence which we have to deal with. First of all, there is Dr. Grant's identification of a previously unknown dinosaur on the Costa Rican mainland. This dinosaur is known only from a partial fragment. It was found in July of this year after it supposedly bit an American girl on a beach. Dr. Grant can tell you more later. I've asked for the original fragment, which is in a lab in New York, to be flown here so that we can inspect it directly. Meanwhile, there is a second piece of evidence. <clears throat> Sorry, just switching hands. And I suppose I could check this too real quick. <clears throat> Costa Rica has an excellent medical service and it tracks all kinds of data or data. Beginning in March, these reports of lizards biting infants in their cribs. God dang it, sorry folks. Beginning in March, there were reports of lizards biting infants in their cribs, and also, I might add, biting old people who were sleeping soundly. These lizard bites were sp sporadically reported in coastal villages from e Ismaloya to Puntaneras. After March, lizard bites were no longer reported. However, I have this graph from the Public Health Service in San Jose on infant mortality in the towns of the West Coast earlier this year. So, just so you folks can see, there is a, a chart here in the book. Um... Here, I'll, I just want to make sure that you folks can also see it over on Twitch and YouTube. So right there. This chart is meant to track infant mortality from uh, March of that year to where they are currently. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Just had to make sure we got all that set up. I direct your attention to the two features of this graph, Gennaro said. First, infant mortality is low in the months of January and February, then spikes in March, and then it's low again in April. But from May onward, it is high, right through July, the month the American girl was bitten. 
the public health service feels that there's something new, that something is now affecting infant mortality, and it's not being reported by the workers in the coastal villages. The second feature is puzzling bi-weekly spiking, which seems to suggest some kind of alternating phenomenon is at work. The lights came back on. All right, Gennaro said. That's the evidence I wanted to explain. Now, are there any... We can save ourselves a great deal of trouble, Malcolm said. I'll explain it for you now. You will? Yes. First of all, animals have very likely gotten off the island. Oh, balls, Hammond said, growling from the back. And second, the graph from the public health service is almost uncertainly is almost certainly unrelated to any animals that have escaped. Grant said, how do you know that? You'll notice the graph alternates between high and low spikes, Malcolm said. That is a characteristic of many complex systems. For example, water dripping from a tap. If you turn on the faucet just a little, you get a constant drip, drip, drip. But if you open it a little more, there becomes a bit of turbulence in the flow, and you'll get alternating large and small drops. Drip, 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 drip. Just like that. You can try it yourself. Turbulence produces alternation. It's a signature. And you will get an alternating graph like this for the spread of any new illness in a community. But why do you say it's not caused by escaped dinosaurs, Grant said. Because it is a non-linear signature, Malcolm said. You need hundreds of escaped dinosaurs to cause it, and I don't think hundreds of dinosaurs have escaped. So I conclude that some other phenomenon, such as a new variety of flu, is causing the fluctuations you're seeing in the graphs. Gennaro said, but you think dinosaurs have escaped? Probably, yes. Why? Because of what you are attempting here. Look, this island is an attempt to recreate a nat natural environment from the past, to make an isolated world where extinct creatures roam free freely, correct? Yes. But from any point of view, such an undertaking is impossible. The mathematics are so self-evident that they don't need to be calculated. It's rather like asking you whether on a billion dollars in income you'd have to pay tax. You wouldn't need to pull out your calculator to check. You'd know that tax was owed. And similarly, I know overwhelmingly that, no, that one cannot s successfully duplicate nature in this way or hope to isolate it. Why not? After all, there are zoos. Zoos don't recreate nature, Malcolm said. Let's be clear. Zoos take the nature that already exists and modify it very slightly to create holding pens for animals. Even those minimal modifications often fail. The animals escape with regularity, but a zoo is not a model for this park. This park is attempting something far more ambitious than that, something much more akin to making a space station on Earth. Gennaro shook his head. I don't understand. Well, it's very simple. Except for the air, which flows freely, everything about this park is meant to be isolated. Nothing gets in, nothing out. The animals kept here are never to mix with the greater ecosystems of Earth, and they are never to escape. And they never have, Hammond snorted. Such isolation is impossible, Malcolm said flatly. It simply cannot be done. It can. It's done all the time. I beg your pardon, Malcolm said, but you have no idea what you're talking about. You arrogant little snot, Hammond said. He stood and walked out of the room. Gentlemen, gentlemen, Gennaro said. I'm sorry, Malcolm said, but the point remains. What we call nature is, in fact, a complex system of a far greater subtlety than we are all willing to accept. We made a simplified image of nature, and then we botch it up. I'm no environmentalist, but you have to understand what you don't understand. How many times must the point be made? How many times must we see the evidence? We build the Aswan Dam and claims it's going to revitalize the country. Instead, it destroys the fertile Nile Delta, produces parasitic infections, and wrecks the Egyptian economy. We build the, excuse me, Gennaro said, but I think I hear the helicopter. That's probably the sample for Dr. Grant to look at. He started out of the room, and they all followed. <clears throat> I don't know why the Mario theme just popped in my head all of a sudden, but it did. And you're going to deal with it. Hey, everyone here on, uh, on the Twitch, thank you all for joining me. Uh, Maverick, the only thing you've really missed is uh, a couple chapters here, but you can always go back and rewatch it. It shouldn't be too much that you missed. I hope you're enjoying Jurassic World Evolution while you're uh, while you're listening. <clears throat> At the foot of the mountain, Genera was screaming over the sound of the helicopter. The veins of his neck were sticking out. You did what? You invited who? Take it easy, Hammond said. Gennaro screamed, Are you out of your goddamned mind? Now look here, Hammond said, drawing himself up. I think we have to get something clear. No, Gennaro said. No, you get something clear. This is not a social outing. This is not a weekend excursion. This is my island, Hammond said, and I can invite whomever I want. 
This is a serious investigation of your of your island because your investors are concerned that that's out of control. We think this is a very dangerous place, and you're not going to shut me down, Donald. I will if I have to. This is a safe place, Hammond said, no matter what the damn mathematician is saying. It's not, and I'll demonstrate its safety. I want you to put them right back on that helicopter, Nirav said. Can't, Hammond said, pointing towards the clouds. It's already leaving. And indeed, the sound of the rotors was fading. God damn it! Don't you see you're needlessly risking... Uh-uh. Let's continue this later. I don't want to upset the children. Grant turned and saw two children coming down the hillside, led by Ed Regis. There was a bespectacle... Sorry, fumbled that word. Give me one second. <clears throat> there was a bespectacled, bespectacled boy of about 11 and a girl a few years younger, perhaps seven or eight, her blonde hair pushing up a big Mets baseball cap and a baseball glove slung over her shoulder. The two kids made their way nimbly down the path from the helipad and stopped some distance from Gennaro and Hammond. Low under his breath, Gennaro said, Christ. Now take it easy, Hammond said. Their parents are getting a divorce and I want them to have a fun weekend here. The girl waved tentatively. Hi, Grandpa, she said. We're here. Obviously, that is the introduction of Lex and Tim in the novels. And uh, I apologize about every hour, every 40 minutes. We're going to take a break so I can breathe and grab some water. So give me just a moment here. We can set TikTok up here real quick. And then we're going to set this over to be right back. You folks should still be able to hear me. Just making sure. I know not everyone's a big fan of Lex, um, but you, the, this is this is the introduction to Lex and Tim, the the whole the whole nine yards, the whole shebang. Perfect, perfect. Okay, seems like everything is all set for me to take my mask on. I just had to make sure. Um. Yeah, Hammond, so you guys might start kind of understanding a little more. Hammond is getting much, much uh, bolder and is revealing how how terrifying he truly is and how bad he truly is. Uh, Lego Batman over on uh, TikTok, thank you very much for the uh, for the roses and the chili. Thank you, much appreciated. Oh, and my buddy Prehistoric is in here too, Dino Guy. Are you in here? If you are, I, I just want to say thank you very much for joining me, my friend. I'm, I'm glad to have you here, and I hope you're enjoying the Jurassic Park read-through. Um, if, if you My Twitch, for those of you asking, is the same as my name. It's the Dino Facts. Um, but yeah, I... Oh, wow, there's a few people. Uh, hold on a second here. Just got to find what I'm looking for again. If, if he'd like to hop in and maybe, you know, sit in with us while we read, he's more than welcome to. Same with any of my other uh, content creator friends on TikTok and YouTube and stuff like that. If any of you guys do happen to be in here and you guys want to, you know, sit in on the reading and have anything you guys would like to say, I'd be more than happy to have you guys in here. Lego Man, I see your comments. Um, I am planning on making a Discord server. My buddy Prof, who I normally game with, is actually helping me set it up. So uh, once it is set up, you guys should definitely, definitely give some big W's to Prof because he is the main reason it's getting set up in the first place. Because um, like, don't get me wrong, I tried to do it, but I'm just not as good as other people at setting up Discord servers, and Prof taught me a lot. So I highly recommend that. What do you mean? Like after the TikTok ban, Foca? If the, if the TikTok ban goes through, I'll still be making content on YouTube, yes. <laughs> the Discord Facts isn't a bad one. Right now, it's just called the Dino Facts Community Server. So, you know... Potatoes, thank you very much for following the Twitch. I appreciate that a lot, honestly. Pineapple, what's pineapple? What is it? Is this Kevin Hart? Pineapples? Pineapples. Oh, man, this water feels so nice. I'm not going to lie. 
No, if it, if TikTok gets banned, so for those of you who don't really know, the TikTok ban thing, it's not like, it's it's a United States sort of situation. You, you shouldn't have to worry if you're in another country or anything like that unless they have rules for it as well. The United States just has some kind of issue right now with TikTok because basically it's a competitive, it's a competing social media company for American companies and they're all focused on money. You can hear everything you want. You can listen to all their reasons. All their reasons are crap. The only reason they want to get TikTok off is because they can't control it and that's the only reason they want TikTok on. Um, so in a, if you live in the United States, yes, you have to worry about TikTok possibly being banned. If you live in Canada, you shouldn't have to worry about it. Um, that all being said, it's dumb that they're trying to ban it in the first place. And, uh, I, there's, I mean, there's not much I can do about it. You know what I'm saying? But I'll always advocate for it not being banned because it's stupid to ban information apps like TikTok. And, uh, if you guys aren't aware, many people get their news from TikTok itself. So like, it's not just some minor thing either. Uh, I definitely would not want to see TikTok go. So. <clears throat> Sinister fears. I mean, hey, if you watch me on YouTube, then you ain't got nothing to worry about in the first place. I'll still be making videos and everything for YouTube. And now for Twitch and Instagram as well. Um, and I post on Facebook too. So if you guys don't mind giving me a follow on Facebook, I, I'm on everything except Twitter, unfortunately. Some of you don't think of TikTok as an information app and that's fine. But for many people, it is. A lot of people get news from this app because there's un, a lot of unbiased, or not necessarily unbiased news, but there's just a lot of news information you can get from here. And yes, if, even if you don't use TikTok as an information app, it is an information app, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. Ceratosaurus, I think Ceratosaurus is taller than Utah Raptor, but I'm not positive off the top of my head. Utah Raptor is a pretty large animal, but tall is, Ceratosaurus certainly weighed more than Utah Raptor, I'll say that much. Um, it was, it's not that simple, green screen thera. Birds didn't just survive because they were small creatures. That's just one of the reasons they survived. Um, but it is not the sole reason that they survive. Uh, my favorite dinosaur far and above is Giganotosaurus, for those of you asking. Castle Rook, that's not a horrible way to, uh, to describe it, but he's real Walt Disney, not the thing that Disney always pitches to you. He's the Walt Disney that wasn't necessarily the greatest. Um, one thing that I don't know a lot about is dinosaur heights because, uh, people always ask like how tall, what's taller than this? And sure, certain things are taller, but height doesn't really matter a lot of the times when it comes to dinosaurs. And usually if height, height is recorded, it'll be hip height or shoulder height, which means it's much more difficult to determine what the animal would be at the peak of its head. You know what I'm saying? Jose knows it's because Kazo couldn't reach the, couldn't reach the birds. He couldn't get them all. He got the pterosaurs on a bad day, though. That's why they all went extinct. On a patasaurus? Sure, I, I could definitely do a video on a patasaurus sometimes. I have done a video on a patasaurus in the past, but that was a long time ago. So I suppose there's definitely due for an update. Of course, of course. All right, give me just a second and we'll get this back going. Everybody who's hopping in here on TikTok, much appreciated. Everybody who's here on YouTube and Twitch, you guys are always appreciated. And I, I cannot thank you all enough. I'll double check, Malaysian. I don't think that they were only six feet tall. Um, I, that just doesn't see, sound right to me for Ceratosaurus. My favorite herbivore, it's either Lambiosaurus or Pachyrhinosaurus. Pachyrhinosaurus is my favorite Ceratopsian, and Lambiosaurus is my favorite Hadrosaur. So, you know. <clears throat> Alrighty.
I'm back, TikTok. Give me one second and I'll be back for YouTube as well. And Twitch. Bada bing, bada boom. Jurassic World Alive video? Perhaps. I haven't done Jura I haven't played Jurassic World Alive in a long time. Paris Roloff is a very cool animal. Where is the book? There is the book. All right. And the next chapter is called The Tour. And it takes place of probably one of the best characters in any of the Jurassic Park books, Tim. Tim Murphy could see at once that something was wrong. His grandfather was in the middle of an argument with the younger, red-faced man opposite to him, and the other adults, standing behind, looked embarrassed and uncomfortable. Alexis felt the tension, too, but she hung back, tossing her baseball in the air. He had to push her. Go on, Lex. Go on yourself, Timmy. Don't be a worm, he said. Lex glared at him, but Ed Regas said cheerfully, I'll introduce you to everybody, and then we can take the tour. I have to go, Lex said. I'll just introduce you first. No, I have to go. But Ed Regas was already making introductions. First to Grandpa, who kissed them both, and then to the man he was arguing with. This was. This man was muscular, and his name was Gennaro. The rest of the introductions were a blur to Tim. There was a blonde woman wearing shorts, and a man with a beard who wore jeans and a Hawaiian shirt. He looked like the outdoors type. Then, a fat college kid who had something to do with computers. And finally, a thin man in black, who didn't shake hands, but just nodded his head. Tim was trying to organize his impressions and looking at the blonde woman's legs when he suddenly realized that he knew who the bearded man was. Your mouth is open, Lex said. Tim, Tim goes, I know him. Oh, sure. You just met him. No, Tim said. I have his book. The bearded man looked at him and said, What book is that, Tim? Lost World of the Dinosaurs, Tim said. Alexis snickered. Daddy says Tim has dinosaurs on the brain. Tim hardly heard her. He was thinking of what he knew about Alan Grant. Alan Grant was one of the principal advocates on the theory that dinosaurs were warm-blooded. He had done lots of digging at the place called Egg Hill in Montana, which was famous because so many dinosaur eggs had been found there. Professor Grant had found most of the dinosaur eggs that had ever been discovered. He was also a good he was also he was also a good illustrator, and he drew the pictures for his own books. Dinosaurs on the brain, the bearded man said. Well, as a matter of fact, I've got the same problem. Me too, Lex. Or me too, Alan. Me too, Tim. Like, dinosaurs on the brain, that's something I've always said. <clears throat> Dad says dinosaurs are really stupid, Lex said. He says Tim should get out, of, get out in the air and play more sports. Tim felt embarrassed. I thought you had to go, he said. In a minute, Lex said. I thought you were in such a rush. I'm the one who would know, don't you think, Timothy? She said, putting her hands on her hips, copying her mother's most irritating stance. Tell you what, Edrigas said. Why don't we all just head on over to the visitor center and we can begin our tour? Everybody started walking and Tim heard Grandpa. Uh, Tim heard Gennaro whisper to his grandpa, I could kill you for this. And then Tim looked up and saw Dr. Grant had fallen into step beside him. Uh, another thing too, Grant in the books makes it very clear he doesn't really like kids. Not a, not a big children guy. However, in the, or not in the book, in the film, makes it very clear he's not a children's guy. Doesn't like kids, doesn't like people. In the movie, or in the book, he, he loves children. Like, he has no issue with them. No, and I know it was like a character trait that they added for him in the films, but yeah, not, not, uh, not the same. Crimson, that's a pretty good pick for your favorite Jurassic dinosaur. <clears throat> How old are you, Tim? He asked. Eleven. And how long have you been interested in dinosaurs? Tim swallowed. A while now, he said. He felt nervous to be talking to Dr. Grant. We go to museums sometimes, when I can talk my family into it, my father. Your father's not especially interested? Tim nodded and told Grant about his family's last trip to the Museum of Natural History. His father had looked at a skeleton and said, That's a big one. Tim had said, No, Dad, that's a medium-sized one. I can't disaurus. Oh, I don't know. Looks pretty big to me. It's not even full grown, Dad. His father squinted at the skeleton. What is it? Jurassic? Jesus. No. Cretaceous. Cretaceous? What's the difference between Cretaceous and Jurassic? Only about a hundred million years, Tim said. Cretaceous is older? No, Dad. Jurassic is older. 
Well, his father had said, stepping back, it looks pretty damn big to me. And he turned Tim and he turned to Tim for agreement. Tim knew he had better agree with his father, so he had just muttered something. And they went on to another exhibit. Tim stood in front of one of in front of one skeleton, a Tyrannosaurus Rex, the mightiest predator the earth had ever known, for a long time. Finally, his father said, What are you looking at? I'm counting the vertebrae, Tim said. The vertebrae? In the backbone. I know what vertebrae are, his father said, annoyed. He stood there a while longer, and then he asked, Why are you counting the vertebrae? I think they're wrong. Tyrannosaurus should only have 37 vertebrae in the tail. This one has more. You mean to tell me, his father said, that the Museum of Natural History has a skeleton that's wrong? I can't believe that. Tim shrugged. It's wrong. His father stomped off toward a guard in the corner. What did you do now, his mother said to Tim. I didn't do anything. I just said the dinosaur's wrong, that's all. And then his father came back with a funny look on his face, because of course the guard told him that the Tyrannosaurus had too many vertebrae in the tail. How did you know that, his father asked. I read it in a book, Tim said. That's pretty amazing, son, he said, and he put his hand on his shoulder, giving it a squeeze. You know how many vertebrae belong in that tail? I've never seen anything like it. You really do have dinosaurs on the brain, don't you? And then his father said he wanted to catch the last half of the Mets game on TV, and Lex said she did too, so they left the museum. And Tim didn't see any other dinosaurs, which they had come for in the first place. But that's how things happened in his family. So obviously Tim is kind of a somewhat neglected child, unfortunately. Um... TK, thank you for the subscription on YouTube. He's, it's not necessarily that he's neglected, but it's just his dad expects him to be one thing, and he wants to be another. So, you know, you can't really blame the kid. Yeah, you're, I think you're right. They add, he added the hating kids for the dramatic tension. Ghost, congrats on getting the number one gifted job. Thank you, er, gifted. Thank you for uh, gifting some bits and such. There's some roses and whatnot. <clears throat> and uh, once again, just thank you for everybody who's watching right now. And we're going back into it. How things used to happen in this family, Tim corrected himself. Now that his father was getting a divorce from his mother, things would probably be different. His father had already moved out, and even though it was weird at first, Tim liked it. He thought his mother had a boyfriend, but he couldn't be sure, and of course, he would never mention it to Lex. Lex was heartbroken to be separated from her father, and in the last few weeks, they had become so, she had become so obnoxious that, was it, 502, was it 5027, Grant said? I'm sorry, Tim said, jarred from his thoughts. The Tyrannosaurus at the museum, was it 5027? Yes, Tim said. How'd you know? Grant smiled. They've been talking about fixing it for years, but now it may never happen. Why is that? Because of what's taking place here, Grant said, on your grandfather's island. Tim shook his head. He didn't understand what Grant was talking about. My mom said it was just a resort, you know, with swimming and tennis. <laughs> Not exactly, Grant said, laughing. I'll explain as we walk along. <clears throat> now I'm a damned babysitter, Edriguez thought unhappily, tapping his foot as he walked in the visitor center. That was what the old man had told him. You watch my kid, kids like a hawk. They're your responsibility for the weekend. Oh, my head said shut off again. One second. <clears throat> Ed Regis didn't like it at all. He felt degraded. He wasn't a damn babysitter. And for that matter, he wasn't a damn tour guide, even for VIPs. He was the head of public relations for Jurassic Park, and he had much to prepare between now and the opening year, and a year uh, between now and the opening a year away, just to coordinate with PR firms in San Francisco and London, and the agencies in New York and Tokyo was a full-time job, especially since the agencies couldn't yet be told what the resort's real attraction was. The firms were all still designing teaser campaigns, nothing specific, and they were unhappy. Creative people needed nurturing; they needed encouragement to do their best work. He couldn't waste his time taking scientists on tours. But that was the trouble with the, doing a career in public relations. Nobody viewed you as... Nobody saw you as professional. Regus had been down here on the island off and on for the past seven months, and they were still pushing odd jobs at him. Like that episode back in January. Harding should have handled that. Harding or Owens, the general contractor. Instead, it had fallen to Ed Regus. What did he know about taking care of some sick workmen? And now he was the damn tour guide and babysitter. He turned back and counted the heads, still one short. Then, in the back, he saw Dr. Sattler and Matt emerge from the bathroom. 
All right, folks, let's begin our tour on the second floor. <clears throat> Alright. Tim went with the others, following Mr. Regis, Mr. Regis up the black suspended staircase to the second floor of the building. They passed a sign that read, Closed Area, Authorized Personnel Only Beyond This Point. Tim felt a thrill when he saw that sign, and walking down the second floor hallway, they walked down the second floor hallway. One was glass, knocking onto, a, knocking onto a balcony with palm trees in the light mist. On the other walls were stenciled doors like, like offices, reading park, man, park Warden, Guest Services, General Manager. Halfway down the corridor, they came to a glass partition marked with another sign. So this sign, I'm not even going to read it. It's just like a biohazard symbol for those of you who can't see it there. <laughs> I mean, birds are dinosaurs, so you're not wrong there, Eliza, or Eliza. <clears throat> Underneath that one were more signs, Ca more caution size, tetragenetic substances, pregnant women avoid exposure to this area, and danger, radioactive isotopes and use carcinogenic potential. Tim grew more excited all the time. Teratogenetic. Teratogenetic substances, things that made monsters. It gave him a thrill, and he was disappointed to hear Ed Riga say, Never mind the signs. They're up for legal reasons. I can assure you that everything is perfectly safe. He led them through the door, and there was a guard on the other side. Ed Regas turned to the group. You may have noticed that we have a minimum of personnel on the island. We can run this resort with a total of 20 people. Of course, we'll have more when we have guests here, but at the moment, there's only 20. Here's our control room, and the entire park is controlled from here. They paused before win windows and peered into a darkened room that looked like a small version of Mission Control. There was a vertical glass see-through map of the park and facing it a bank of glowing computer consoles. Some of the screens displayed data, but most of them showed video images from around the park. There were just two people inside, standing and talking. The man on the left is our chief engineer, John Arnold. Regis pointed to a thin man in a button-down short sleeve t-shirt and tie, smoking a cigarette. And next to him are Park Warden, Mr. Robert Muldoon, the famous hunter from Nairobi. Muldoon was a burly man in khaki sunglasses dangling from his shirt pocket. He glanced out to the group, gave a brief nod, and turned back to the computer screens. I'm sure you want to see this room, Edriga said, but first, let's see how we obtain the dinosaur DNA. <clears throat> That's pretty cool, honestly. That your love for Jurassic Park is what ended up getting... Causing you to get a bird? That's, that's awesome. The signs on the door said extractions, and like all the other doors in the laboratory, op it opened with a security card. Ed Regis slipped into the card into the slot, and the light blinked, and the door opened. Inside, Tim saw a small room bathed in green light. Four technicians in lab coats were peering into double-barreled stereo microscopes or looking at images on high-resolution video screens. The room was filled with yellow stones. The stones were in glass shelves and cardboard boxes and large pull-out trays. Each stone was tagged and numbered in black ink. Regus introduced Henry Wu, a slender man in his 30s. Dr. Wu is our chief geneticist, and I'll let him explain what we do here. Obviously, you guys know most of these characters, but just for a pause real quick, um, just so if, if you don't entirely, John Arnold, that's Sam Jackson's character from Jurassic Park. Robert Muldoon is Robert Muldoon. I mean, if you don't know who Muldoon is, you probably haven't actually seen Jurassic Park. Um, Ed, Ed Regis and Donald Gennaro are probably the characters that will confuse you the most. And that's because in the movie, they are the same person. They're, they're combined into one character, and that's what makes... And that's what, that's what they are. Gen they're called Gennaro with the appearance of Regis. However, in the book, they're two completely separate people. Ed Regis is public relations manager... Gennaro is a lawyer who is in charge of the investors. <clears throat> and obviously, we just met Henry Wu. 
Henry Wu smiled. At least I'll try. Genetics is a bit complicated, but you're probably wondering where our dinosaur DNA comes from. It crossed my mind, Grant said. As a matter of fact, there are two possible sources. Using the Loy antibody extraction technique, we can sometimes get dinosaur DNA directly from dinosaur bones. What kind of yield, Grant asked. Well, the most sol soluble protein is leached out during fossilization, but 20% of the proteins are still recoverable by grinding up the bones and using by grinding up the bones and using Loy's procedure. Dr. Loy himself has used it to obtain proteins from extinct Australian marsupials, as well as the blood cells from the ancient human remains. His technique is so refined it can work with a mere 15 nanograms of material. That's 15 billionths of a gram. And you've adopted that technique here, Grant asked? Only as a backup, Wu said. As you can imagine, a 20% yield is insufficient for our work. We need the entire dinosaur DNA strand in order to clone, and we get it here. He held up one of the yellow stones, from amber, the fossilized resin of prehistoric tree sapped. Grant looked at Ellie, and then at Malcolm. That's really quite clever, Malcolm said, nodding. I still don't understand. Tree sap, Wu explained, often flows over insects and traps them. The insects are then perfectly preserved within the fossil. One finds all kinds of insects and ambers, including biting insects that have sucked blood from larger animals. Suck the blood, Grant repeated. His mouth fell open. You mean suck the blood of dinosaurs? Hopefully, yes. And then the insects are preserved in amber, Grant shook his head. I'll be damned. That just might work. I assure you, it does work, Wu said. Works in the book, doesn't work in real life. <laughs> He moved to one of the microscopes where a technician positioned a piece of amber containing a fly under the microscope. <clears throat> On the monitor, they watched as he inserted a long needle through the amber into the thorax of the prehistoric fly. If this insect has any foreign blood cells, we may be able to extract them and obtain paleo-DNA. Alright, hold on a second. Hit <clears throat> a bit of boo-boo. Slenderman in the eight pages. Not quite, but you're, you're getting there. Uh, if the insect has any foreign blood cells, we may be able to extract them and obtain paleo-DNA, the DNA of an extinct creature. We won't know for sure, of course, until we extract whatever is in there, replicate it, and test it. That is, why we have, that is what we have been doing for five years now. It's been a long, slow process, but it's paid off. Actually, dinosaur DNA is somewhat easier to extract by this process than mammalian DNA. The reason is that mammalian red cells have no nuclei, and thus no DNA in their red cells. To clone a mammal, you must find a white cell, which is, a much rare, which is much rarer than red cells. But dinosaurs have nucleated red cells, as do modern birds. It is one of the many indicators we have that dinosaurs aren't really reptiles at all. They're just big, leathery birds. Which again, very true. And uh, I know a lot of people are saying Mr. DNA. In the film, a lot of Mr. DNA's line, or Dr. Wu's lines went to Mr. DNA for whatever reason. But in the book, it's Dr. Wu. It's not Mr. DNA nearly as much. <clears throat> uh, well, I don't think Mr. DNA is even in the book. My bad. Tim saw that Dr. Grant still looked skeptical, and Dennis Nedry, the messy fat man, appeared completely uninterested, as if he knew it all already. Nedry kept looking impatiently toward the next room. I see Mr. Nedry has spotted the next phase of our work, Wu said, how we identify the DNA we have extracted. For that, we used powerful computers. They went through the sliding doors into a chilled room. There was a kind of humming sound. Two six-foot-tall round towers stood in the center of the room, and along the walls were rows of waist-high stainless steel boxes. This is our high-tech laundromat, Wu said. The boxes along the walls are all Ham Hamachi Hood automated gene sequencers. Gene sequencers. They are being run at a very high speed by the Cray XMP supercomputers, which are the which are the towers in the center of the room. In essence, you are standing in the middle of an incredibly powerful genetics factory. There were several monitors, all running so fast it was hard to see what they were saying. Wu pushed a button and showed one image. All right, you guys aren't gonna understand what this image means. I'm just gonna show it to you real quick. Um, it's basically a DNA strand being shown to the audience. Hold on, I wanna make sure you guys can see it. So yeah, this here, is basically all of a DNA strand, well not all, but like por a portion of a DNA strand written out.
<clears throat> Here you see the actual structure of a small fragment of dinosaur DNA. Notice the sequence is made up of four base compounds, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. This amount of DNA probably contains instructions to make a single protein, say a hormone or an enzyme. The full DNA molecule contains three billions of these bases. And if we looked at a screen like this once a second for eight hours a day, it'd still take more than two years to look at the entire DNA strand. It's that big. He pointed to the image. This is a typical example because you see the DNA has an error down here in line 1201. And so just to show you guys that too, that's this little blip here in the line. Ah, here, hold on. That's this little blip here. You see how it's going continuously, blip, and then continuously? And that's the DNA strand that they're trying to show that they need to fill in. <clears throat> Much of the DNA we extract is fragmented or incomplete. So the first thing we have to do is repair it, or rather the computer has to do it. It'll cut the DNA using what are called restriction enzymes. The computer will select a variety of enzymes that might do the job. So here, you guys can see that it starts picking different enzymes that might replace the one that was uh, missing. Here is the same section of DNA with the points of the restriction enzymes located. As you can see in line 1201, two enzymes will cut out on either side of the damaged protein. Ordinary, ordinarily, we let the computer decide which to use, but we also need to need but we also need to know which, what base pairs we should insert to repair the injury. For that, we have to align various cut fragments like so. Another little chart here. Well, here, I'll show TikTok first. So, this is what they're talking about, and this one is what they're talking about. <clears throat> Now we are finding a fragment of DNA that overlaps the injury area and will tell us what is missing. And you, can see, and you can see we can find it and go ahead and make the repair. The dark bars you see are restriction fragments, small sections of dinosaur DNA broken by enzymes and then analyzed. The computer is now recombining them by searching for overlapping sections of code. It's a little bit, puzz putting, it's a little bit like putting a puzzle together. The computer can do it very rapidly. The next thing is just a completed version of the other chart without the little missing blink in 1201. <clears throat> and here is the revised DNA strand, repaired by the computer. The operation you've witnessed would have taken months in the conventional lab, but we can do it in seconds. Then, then are you working with the entire DNA strand, Grant asked? Oh no, Wu said, that's impossible. We've come a long way from the 60s when it took the laboratory four years to decode a, a screen like this. Now the computers can do it in a couple hours, but even so, the DNA molecule is too big. We only look at the sections of the strand that differ from animal to animal or contemporary DNA. Only a few percent of the nucleotides differ from one species to the next, and that's what we analyze, and it's still a big job. <clears throat> Dennis Nedry yawned. He'd long ago concluded that InGen must have been doing something like this. A couple of years ago, when InGen had hired Nedry to, to design the park control systems, one of the initial design parameters called for the data records with 3 times 10 to the 9th fields. Nedry just assumed that this was a mistake, and he called Palo Alto to verify. But they had told him that the spec was correct. 3 billion fields. Puzzled, Nedry had, gone to, Nedry had worked on, some, on a lot of large systems. He made a name for himself setting up worldwide telephone communications for multinational corporations. Often, those systems had millions of records. He was used to that, but InGen wanted something so much larger. Puzzled, Nedry had gone to see Barney Fellows over at Symbiolics near the MIT campus in Cambridge. What kind of database has three billion records, Barney? A mistake, Barney said laughing. They put an extra zero in or two. It's not a mistake. I checked. It's, it's what they want. He looked confused. But that's crazy, Barney said. It's not workable. Even if you had the fastest processors and blindingly fast algorithms, a search would still take days, maybe weeks. Yeah, Nedger said, I know. Fortunately, I'm not being asked to do algorithms. I'm just being asked to reserve storage and memory for the overall system. But still, what could the database be for? Barney frowned. You operating under an NDA? Yeah. And Nedry said, most of his jobs required non-disclosures. Can you tell me anything about it? 
It's a bioengineering, bioengineering firm. Bioengineering, Barney said. Well, there's the obvious, which is a DNA molecule. Oh, come on, Nedry said. Nobody could be analyzing a DNA molecule. He knew biologists were talking about the Human Genome Project to analyze a complete human, human DNA strand. But that would take 10 years of coordinated effort involving laboratories all over the world. It was an enormous taking, as big as the Manhattan Project, which, me which made the atomic bomb. This is a private company, Nedry said. With three billion records? I don't know what else it could be. Maybe they're being very optimistic designing their system. Very optimistic, Nedry said. Or maybe they're just analyzing DNA fragments, but they've got RAM-intensive algorithms. That made more sense. Certain databases, search techniques, a up a lot of, a lot of memory. <clears throat> you know who did their algorithm? No, the company is very secretive. Well, my guess is that they're doing something with DNA. What's the system? Multi XMP. Multi XMP? You mean more than one cray? Wow. Barney was frowning now, thinking that one over. Can you tell me anything about else about it? Sorry, Nedry said, I can't. And he had gone back and designed the control systems. It had taken him and his programming team more than a year, but it was especially and it was especially difficult because the company wouldn't ever tell him what the subsystems were for. Their instructions were simple. Design a module for record keeping, or design a module for visual display. They gave him design parameters, but no details about use. He had been working in the dark. And now that the system was up and running, he wasn't surprised to learn that there were bugs. What did they expect? And they'd ordered him to be down here in a panic, all hot and bothered about his bugs. It was annoying, Nedry thought. So, I know a lot of people have opinions on Nedry, this, that, the other thing. I genuinely think InGen screwed him over here and drove him to this. Like... Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying what he did was right, but I'm saying that I get it. In the film, obviously, he's much less sympathetic, but in the books, man, like, it's not really his fault. He's portrayed in a somewhat negative light, but he's really not the bad guy with all the context we're given. He does a bad thing, though, and nothing can really permit that, but, you know. <clears throat> uh, and now there was... About his bugs. Ned returned back to the group as Grant asked, and once the computer has analyzed the DNA, how do you know which animal it encodes? We have two procedures, Wu said. The first is phylogenetic mapping. DNA evolves over time, like everything else in an organism, hands or feet or any other physical attribute. So we can take an unknown piece of DNA and determine roughly, by computer, where it fits in the evolutionary sequence. It's time consuming, but it can be done. And the other way? Just grow it and find out what it is. That's what we usually do, and I'll show you how that's accomplished. <clears throat> Tim felt a growing impatience as the tour continued. He liked technical things, but even so, he was losing interest. They came to the next door, which was marked fertilization. Dr. Wu unlocked the door with his, with his security card, and they went inside. Tim saw still another room with technicians working at microscopes. In the back was a section entirely lit by blue ultraviolet light. Dr. Wu explained that the DNA worked that the DNA work required the interruption of cellular mitosis at precise instants, and therefore they kept some of the most virulent poisons in the world. He helotoxins, calcinoids, and beta alkaloids. Beta alkaloids, he said, pointing to the series of syringes set out under UV light. Kill any living animal within a second or two. Tim would have liked to know more about the poisons, but Dr. Woot droned on about un unfertilized crocodile ova and replacing DNA, and then Professor Grant asked, something, asked some complicated questions. To one side of the rooms were big tanks marked Liquid N2, and there was a big walk-in freezers with shelves of frozen embryos, each stored in a tiny silver foil wrapper. Lex was bored, Nedry was yawning, and even Dr. Sadler was losing interest. Tim was tired looking at these complicated laboratories. He wanted to see dinosaurs. Which, I mean, same, Tim, same. The next room was labeled Hatchery. It's a little warm and damp in here, Dr. Wu said. We keep it at 99 degrees Fahrenheit and a relative humidity of 100%. We also run a higher O2 concentration. It's up to 33%. Oh, a Jurassic atmosphere, Grant said. Yes, at least we presume so. If any of you feel faint, just tell me. Dr. Wu inserted his security card into the slot and the outer door hissed open. Just a reminder, don't touch anything in this room. Some of the eggs are permeable to skin oil. And watch your hands, the sensors are always moving. He opened the inner door to the nursery and they went inside. 
Tim faced a vast open room, bathed in the deep infrared light. The eggs lay on long tables, their pale outlines observed, obscured by hissing low mist that covered the tables. The eggs were all moving gently, rocking back and forth. Reptile eggs contain large amounts of yolk, but no water at all. The embryos must extract water from the surrounding environment, hence the mist. Dr. Wu explained that each table contained 150 eggs and represented a new batch of DNA extractions. The batch were identified by numbers at each table. Stag 458, Trike 390. Waist deep in the mist, the workers in the nursery moved from one egg to the next, plunging their hands into the mist, turning the eggs every hour, and checking the temperatures with thermal sensors. The room was monitored by overhead TV cameras and motion sensors, and an overhead thermal sensor moved from egg to egg, touching each with a flexible wand, beeping, and then going on. In this hatchery, Wu said, <clears throat> in this hatchery, we have produced more than a dozen crops of extractions, giving us a total of 238 animals. Our survival rate is somewhere between four point around 4% and we naturally want to improve that. But by computer analysis, we're working on something like 500 variables, 120 environmental, and another 200 intra-egg, and the rest from the genetic material itself. Our eggs are plastic. The embryos are mechanically inserted and then hatched here. How long before they grow? Dinosaurs mature rapidly, attaining full size in about two to four years. So now we have a number of adult specimens in the park. What do the numbers mean? These codes, Wu said, identify the various batch extractions of DNA. The first four letters identify the animals being grown. Over there, the TRIC means Triceratops, and the STEG means Stegosaurus, and so on. In this table here, Grant said, the code said XXX001-1. Beneath was, was scrawled Presumed Solura. That's a new batch of D DNA. We don't know exactly what will grow out. The first time an extraction is done, we don't know for sure what the animal is. You can see it's marked presumed coelho. So as it likely is, a Solurosaurus, a small herbivore, if I remember. Kind of, that's complicated, but. It's hard for me to keep track of the names. There's something like 300 genera of dinosaur known so far. 347, Tim said. There are many more than that now. Grant smiled and said, is anything hatching now? Not at the moment. The incuba incubation period varies with each animal, but in general, it runs about two months. We try to stagger the hatchings to make less work for the nursery staff. You can imagine how it is when we have 150 animals born within a few days, though of course most don't survive. Actually, these X's are due any day now. Any other questions? No? Then we'll go to the nursery where the newborns are. This is, this sets up one of the most tragic scenes in the book and like one of the saddest ones, but that doesn't come to the end. So you guys can have the joy and then feel that joy ripped away from you at the end of the novel like I did. So suffer with me. <clears throat> it was a circular room, all white. There were some incubators of the kind used in hospital nurseries, but they were empty at the moment. Rags and toys were scattered across the floor, and a young woman in a white coat was seated on the floor, her back to them. What have you got here today, Kathy? Dr. Wu asked. Not much, she said. Just a baby raptor. Let's have a look. The woman got to her feet and stepped aside. Tim heard Nedry say, and it looks like a little lizard. The animal on the floor was, at about a, was about a foot and a half long, the size of a small monkey. It was dark yellow with brown stripes like a tiger, and it had a lizard's head with a long snout. But it stood upright on strong hind legs, balanced on a th thick, straight tail. Its smaller, front ar its smaller forearms waved in the air. It cocked its head to one side and peered at the visitors, staring down at it. Velociraptor, Alan Grant said in a low voice. Velociraptor mongoliensis, who said, nodding. A predator. This one's only six weeks old. <clears throat> I just excavated a raptor, Grant said as he bent down for a closer look. Immediately, the lizard, little lizard sprang up over Grant's head and into Tim's arms. Hey, they can jump, who said. The babies can jump. So can the adults, as a matter of fact. Tim caught the velociraptor and held it to him. The little animal didn't weigh very much, maybe a pound or two. The skin was warm and completely dry, and the little head was inches away from Tim's face. Its dark, beady eyes stared at him, and a small, forked tongue flicked in and out. Will he hurt me? No, she's friendly. And are you sure about that? Asked Janeiro with a look of concern. Oh, quite sure, Wu said, at least until she grows a little older. But in any case, the babies don't have teeth, even egg teeth. Egg teeth, Nedry said? Most dinosaurs are born with egg teeth, little horns on the tip of their nose, like rhino horns, to help them break out of the eggs. 
But raptors aren't. They poke a hole in the eggs with their pointed snouts, and then the nursery staff has to help them out. You have to help them out, Grant said. What happens in the wild? In the wild? Well, when they breed in the wild, Grant said. When they make a nest. Oh, they, they can't do that, Wu said. None of our animals is capable of breeding. That's why we have this nursery. It's the only way to replace stock in Jurassic Park. Why can't the animals breed? Well, as you can imagine, it's important that they are not able to breed. At, and whenever we faced a critical matter such as this, we designed redundant systems. That is, we always arranged at least two control procedures. In this case, there are two independent reasons why the animals can't breed. First of all, they're sterile because we irradiate them with x-rays. And the second reason? All the animals in Jurassic Park are female, Wu said with a pleased smile. Malcolm frowned and said, I should like some clarification about this, because it seems to me that irradiation is fraught with uncertainty. The radiation dose may be all wrong or aimed at the wrong anatomical area of the animal. All true, Wu said, but we're confident we have destroyed the gonadal tissue. And as for them all being female, Malcolm said, is that checked? Does anyone go out and uh, lift up the dinosaur skirts to have a look? I mean, how does one determine the sex of a dinosaur anyway? Sex or organs vary with species. It's easy to tell on some, subtle on others. But to answer your questions, the reason we know all the animals are female is that we literally make them that way. We control their chromosomes and we control the intra-egg developmental environment. From a bioengineering standpoint, females are much easier to breed. You probably know that all vertebrate embryos are inherently female anyways. We all start life as females. It takes some kind of added effect such as a hormone at the right moment of development or right temperatures to transform the growing embryo into a male, but left to its own devices, the embryo will naturally become female. So our animals are all female. We tend to refer to some of them as male, such as the Tyrannosaurus rex, we all call it a him, but in fact, they're all female. And believe me, they can't breed. <clears throat> How are we enjoying ourselves, folks? Almost done with this chapter, and then we're going to take a short break here. <clears throat> the Life Finds a Way line is not quite yet, but it's, it's going to be there. It's going to be there, trust me. The little velociraptor sniffed at Tim and then rubbed her head against Tim's neck. Tim giggled. She wants you to feed her, Wu said. What does she eat? Mice, but she's just eaten, so we won't feed her for a while. The little raptor leaned back and stared at Tim and wiggled her little forearms again in the air. Tim saw the small claws on the three fingers of each hand and then the raptor burrowed her head against his neck again. Grant came over and peered critically at the creature. He touched the tiny three-clawed hand and said to Tim, Do you mind? And Tim released the raptor into his hand. Grant flipped the animal onto its back, inspecting it while the little lizard wiggled and squirmed. Then he lifted the animal high to look at its profile and it screamed shrilly. She doesn't like that, Regus said, doesn't like to be held away from the body contact. The raptor was still screaming, but Grant wasn't paying any attention. Now he was squeezing the tail, feeling the, bo the bones. Regus said, Dr. Grant, if you please, I'm, I'm not hurting her. Dr. Grant, these creatures are not of our world. They come from a, t for a time when there was no human beings around to poke and prod them. I'm not prodding and Dr. Grant, put her down, Ed Regus said, but now. Regus was starting to get annoyed. Grant handed the animal back to Tim, and it stopped squealing. Tim could feel its little heart beating rapidly against her chest. I'm sorry, Dr. Grant, Riga said, but these animals are delicate in infancy. We have lost several from postnatal stress syndrome, which we believe to be adrenocortically mediated. Sometimes they die within five minutes. Tim petted the little raptor again. It's okay, kid. Everything's fine now. The heart was still beating rapidly. We feel it is important that the animals here be treated in the most humane manner possible, Riga said. I promise you that we'll have every opportunity to examine them later. But Grant couldn't stay away. He again moved towards the animals in Tim's arm, peering at it. The little velociraptor opened her jaws and hissed at Grant in a posture of sudden, intense fury. Fascinating, Grant said. Can I stay and play with her, Tim said? Not right now. Ed Regas glanced at his watch. It's three o'clock, and it's a good time for a tour of the park itself so you can all see the dinosaurs and the habitats we have designed for them. Tim released the raptor, which scampered across the room, grabbed a cloth rag, put it in her mouth, and tugged at the end with her tiny claws. So, obviously, this little creature is adorable. See, Quiles, thank you very much for subscribing. Much appreciated. Give me one second here, folks. I'm going to take a little pause. 
just so I can get something to drink. Get, get a little drink. Ralph is also adorable, but we don't see Ralph until much later in the book. Whew. So, I mean, it. Ralph is adorable. I will not deny that whatsoever. You don't know that. Don't talk about Ralph that way. You know if he is or not. Casual, how dare you? You can't talk about him that way. Ugh. Thank you guys all for joining and liking the live and everything on TikTok. Much appreciated. I know, but you don't have, we don't take that slander around here. We, we know what happened. That doesn't mean we accept what happened. Ralph is a triceratops that we meet later down the line. Yes. But obviously we don't meet him until a little later down the line. So, you know, that's its own sort of situation. Um, folks, while we're taking this short break, remember if you guys definitely should go check out the, uh, my latest full length video we're doing a review of Dr. Drolin's dictionary of dinosaurs. It would be super cool if you guys check that book out. Definitely would 10 out of 10 do recommend. Oh, is Wade in here? I'm sorry, man. I'm not seeing a lot of these people who are joining. Man. Give me one second. I'll, I'll invite Wade. Because, I mean, shoot. that I love that guy. He is so awesome. If you guys like Go Godzilla, King Kong, any of that kind of stuff, definitely go check out Wade. He's w I think his name is Wade Willie on TikTok. Um... He's, he always makes some awesome Godzilla and Kong content, and uh, he's kind of the opposite of the spectrum for me, right? So it's kind of it's nice to be able to talk to someone whose favorite is the opposite of me. He he's more interested in Kong. He, his favorite is certainly Kong. Not saying he doesn't like Godzilla, but I my most interested one is certainly Godzilla itself. So you know that is pretty. It's just really nice to have a buddy who's who you can share differing opinions like that with. You you enjoy different. Uh, Aspects of the same side, you know what I mean? Two sides of the same coin. Yes, there is a Lost World Jurassic Park novel. In fact, the novel that I'm reading out of, um, it actually, uh, whatchamacallit? The novel that I'm reading out of has two versions, or has both the first and the, and the, uh, or the original Jurassic Park and the Lost World in it. So it's got both of them. So once we finish Jurassic Park, we'll probably start uh, The Lost World up and do those on Fridays. But there's a ways to go before that. We're only about 100 pages into the book. Um, hello to everybody coming back. Goodbye to everybody leaving, and I hope everybody is enjoying. How do I invite someone to watch my live on TikTok? Can I, can I do that? Hello to everybody joining. I see a couple people over here on TikTok hopping in, so much appreciated. It's be Malaysian Soral Fagan X is because people just like to argue about things. Like, I, I don't know what it is, but, like, I swear to God. I've been all right, Tim. My favorite dinosaur is Giganotosaurus. I don't mind that question. I get it a lot. I completely understand.
how do I invite someone to the stream? I feel like I feel like there should be a way to do that, but I can't remember. Oh, there we go. Okay. Remember me. Uh, Alright, well, I guess uh, none of the homies are in this right now, so that's alright. We'll, we'll get this mask back on here in a second and continue. Always recommend Godzilla Minus One. Probably the best Godzilla movie that's ever come out. Oh, I shouldn't say the best Godzilla movie that's ever come out, but you know what I mean. Goodbye to everybody leaving, and once again, hello to everybody joining. Remember me. Remember me Though I have to say goodbye Remember me Please don't let it make you cry For even if I'm far away I'll hold you in my heart I'll sing a secret song for you Each night we are apart Alright, sorry, getting back to this I, I get distracted by songs sometimes my, my mind be listening to music on its own Exactly, casual guy. Colorless Soldier, what's up? Nice to see you in here today. Everybody who happens to also have a Twitch, if you're both on TikTok or YouTube, I would much appreciate if you guys could definitely um, give me uh, a follow on Twitch as well. It would be much, much appreciated. Um, so we ended the last chapter with them meeting the baby Velociraptor, and now we're going into the control room. And this chapter is appropriately called Control. Walking back toward the control room, Malcolm said, I have one more question, Dr. Wu. How many different species have you made so far? I'm not exactly sure, Wu said. I believe the number at the moment is 15. 15 species. Do you know, Ed? Yes, it's 15, Regis said, nodding. You don't know for sure, Malcolm said, afflicting astonishment. Uh, Wu smiled. I stopped counting he said, after the first dozen, and you have to realize that sometimes we think we have an animal correctly made from the standpoint of the DNA, which is our basic work, and the animal grows for six months, and then something untoward happens, and then we realize there is some error. A releaser gene isn't operating, a hormone's not being released, or some other problems in the developmental sequence. So we have to go back to the drawing board with that animal, so to speak. He, he smiled. At one time, I thought we had more than 20 species, but now only 15. And as one of the 15 species, uh, Malcolm turned to Grant. What, is, what was the name? Procum Sognathus, Grant said. You have made some Procum Sognathuses, or whatever they're called, Malcolm asked. Oh yes, Wu said immediately. Compies are very distinctive animals, and we've made an unusually large number of them. <clears throat> Why is that? Well, we want Jurassic Park to be as real an environment as possible as authentic as possible, and the Procomsognathids are actual scavengers from the Triassic and Jurassic periods, rather like jackals. So we wanted to have the compies around to clean up. You mean dispose of carcasses? Yes, if there were any, but we've only had, well, with only 238 animals in our total population, we don't have many carcasses, Wu said. That wasn't the primary objective. Actually, we wanted the compies around for another kind of waste management entirely. Which was, well, we have some very big herbivores on this island. We have... We have specifically tried not to breed the biggest sauropods, but even so, we've got several anim animals out there in excess of 30 tons walking around, and many others in the 5 to 10 ton area. That gives us two problems. One is feeding them, and in fact, we must import food to the island every two weeks. There is no way an, animal this, or an island this small can support these animals for any time. But the other problem is waste. I don't know if you've ever seen elephant droppings, but they are substantial. Every spore is roughly the size of a soccer ball. Imagine the droppings of a brontosaurus, ten times larger. Now imagine, the, now imagine the droppings of a herd of such animals, as we keep here. 
and the largest animals do not digest their food terribly well, so that they excrete a great deal. And in the 60 million years since dinosaurs disappeared, apparently the bacteria that specialize in breaking down their feces disappeared too. At least the sauropod feces don't decompose readily. That's a problem, Malcolm said. I assure you, it is, Wu said, not smiling. We had a hell of a time trying to solve it. You probably know that in Africa there is a specific insect, the dung beetle, who eats elephant species. Many other large species have associated creatures that have evolved to eat their excrement. Well, it turns out the compies will eat the feces of large herbivores and redigest it, and the droppings of compies are readily broken down by contemporary bacteria. So, given enough compies, our problem was solved. How many compies did you make? I've forgotten example, exactly, but I think the target population was 50 animals, and we attained that, or very nearly so, in three batches. We did a batch about every six months until we had the number we were looking for. 50 animals, Malcolm said. That's a lot to keep track of. The control room is built to do exactly that. They'll show you how it's done. I'm sure, Malcolm said, but if one of these compies were to escape from the island to get away, they can't get away, Wu said. I know that, but just suppose one did. You mean like the animal that was found on the beach, Wu said, raising his eyebrows? The one that bit the American girl? Yes, for example. <clears throat> I don't know what the explanation for that animal is, Wu said, but I know it can't possibly want be one of ours for two reasons. First, the control procedures our animals are counted by the computer every few minutes. If one were missing, we'd know at once. And the second reason? The mainland is more than 100 miles away. It takes almost a day to get there by boat. And in the outside world, our animals will die within 12 hours. How do you know? Because I've made sure that's precisely what will occur, Wu said. Finally, showing a trace of irritation. Look, we're not fools. We understand there are pre these are prehistoric animals. They are p part of a vanished ecology, a complex web of life that became extinct millions of years ago. They might have no predators in the contemporary world, no checks on their growth. We don't want them to survive in the wild, so I've made them lies independent. I inserted a gene that makes a single faulty enzyme in a protein metabolism, and as a result, the animals cannot manufacture the amino acid lysine. They must ingest it from an outside source. Unless they get a rich dietary source of ex exogenous hot lysine supplied by us in tablet form, they'll go into a coma within 12 hours and die. These animals are genetically engineered to be unable to survive in the real world. They can only live here, in Jurassic Park. They are not free at all. They are essentially our prisoners. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry, folks. I apologize. That is my complete bad. Oh, my God. It your boy. Sorry, everybody. Sorry. I'm so sorry. My apologies. I am so sorry, everybody. It uh, looks like it's back up now, though. Um, once again, my apologies for that, folks, but we are back up and running on... Perfect, perfect, perfect. Oh, got a little notification. Dragon, thank you for the subscription. Much appreciated. Thank you, Dragon. As long as it's safe for work fan art, sure. <clears throat> uh. All right, sorry. Back into this. Where were we? All right, so they're essentially our prisoners. That's where we left off at. Here's the control room, Edriga said. Now that you know how these animals are made, you'll want to see the control room for the park itself before we go on the before we go out on the he stopped. Through the thick glass window window the room was dark. The monitors were off except for three th for three that displayed spinning numbers and the images of a large boat. What's going on? Edriga said. Oh hell, they're docking. Docking? Every two weeks the supply boat comes in from the mainland. One of the things this island doesn't have is a good harbor or even a good dock. It's a little hairy to get the ship in when the seas are rough. Could be a few minutes. He rapped on the window, but the men inside paid no attention. I guess we'll have to wait then. Ellie turned to Dr. Wu. Ellie turned to Dr. Wu. You mentioned before that sometimes you make an animal and it seems to go be fine, but 
as it grows, it shows itself to be flawed. Oop, hold on. My headset turned off again. <clears throat> to those of you leaving, I hope you guys enjoyed yourself and had a great time. To those of you joining, I hope you guys are still enjoying. I'm sorry that you don't enjoy these ads. I'll try to make maybe less ads. Uh, I don't know how, uh, I thought that I only, I have it on like the lower frequency, so it shouldn't be running too many ads at once. <clears throat> uh, da, ba, ba, ba. Oh, hold on, just wanna. Mikolaj, thank you very much for subscribing. Jurassic Kid, you too. Thank you guys very much. Subscribing on YouTube. Some YouTube subs. Uh, I don't plan on doing a face reveal anytime soon, no. <laughs> hey, thank you all the folks who are sharing the live in here. Much appreciated. Uh, all right. Yes, Wu said, and I don't think there's any way around that. We could duplicate the DNA, but there's a lot of timing in development, and we don't know if everything is working unless we actually see an animal develop correctly. Grant said, so how do you know if it's developing correctly? No one has ever seen these animals before. Wu smiled this time. I've often thought about that, and I suppose it's a bit of a paradox. Eventually, I hope, paleontologists such as yourself will compare our animals with the fossil record to verify the developmental sequence. Ellie said, but the animals we just saw, the Velociraptor, you said it was a Mongoliensis? From the location of the amber, Wu said, it is from China. Interesting, Grant said. I just dug up an infant, uh, Antiropus. Are there any full-grown raptors here? All right, pause real quick. So Antiropus, I don't know if you heard him say that there. Antiropus is Deinonychus. Deinonychus Antiropus. So they're, they're literally just swapping the name Velociraptor for Deinonychus here in the book. Um... Yeah, so I was just digging up an infant Antiropus. Are there any full-grown raptors here? Yes, Edriga said without hesitation. Eight adult females. The females are the real hunters. They're pack hunters, you know. Will we see them on the tour? No, Wu said, looking suddenly uncomfortable. And there was an awkward pause. Wu looked at Regis. Not for a while, Regis said cheerfully. The velociraptors haven't been in integrated into the park setting just yet. We're keeping them in holding pens. Can I see them there? Uh, why, yes, of course. In fact, while we're waiting, he glanced at his watch, you might want to go around and have a look at them. I certainly would, Grant said. Absolutely, Ellie said. Can I go too? Tim said eagerly. Just go around the back of this building, past the support facility, and you'll see the pen. But don't get too close to the fence. Do you want to go too? He said to the little girl. No, Lex said. She looked up, she looked appraisingly at Regis. You want to throw, play a little pickle? Throw a few? Well, sure, Ed Regis said. Why don't you and I go downstairs and we'll do that while we wait for the control room to open up. <clears throat> Grant walked with Ellie and Malcolm around the back of the main building with the, kids ta with the kid tagging along. Grant liked kids. It was impossible not to like any group so openly enthusiastic about dinosaurs. Facts. Um, Grant used to watch kids in the museums as they stared open-mouthed at the big skeletons rising above them. He wondered what the fascination really represented. He finally decided that children liked dinosaurs because these giant creatures personified the uncontrollable force of looming authority. They were symbolic parents, fascinating and frightening, like parents. And kids loved them as they loved their parents. Grant also suspected that that was why even young children learned the name of dinosaurs. It never failed to amaze him when a three-year-old shrieked Stegosaurus, saying the very complicated names the way of, was a way of exerting power over the giants, a way of being in control. What do you know about Velociraptor? Grant asked him. He was just making conversation. It's a small creature that hunted in packs, like Deinonychus, Tim said. That's right, although the evidence for pack hunting is all circumstantial. It derives in part from the appearance of the animals, which are quick and strong, but small for dinosaurs, just 150 to 300 pounds each. We assume they hunted in groups if they want, were to bring down larger prey, and there are some fossil finds in which a single large prey is associated with several raptor skeletons, suggesting they hunted in packs. And of course, raptors were large-brained, more intelligent than most dinosaurs. How intelligent is that? Malcolm asked. Depends on who you talk to. 
Grant said, just as paleontologists have come to, around to the idea that pe dinosaurs were probably warm-blooded, a lot of us are starting to think that some of them might have been quite intelligent, too, but nobody knows for sure. They left the visitor area behind, and soon they heard the loud hum of generators and the sm smelled the faint odor of gasoline. Uh, just another pause here real quick. Um, the nobody knows for sure thing, we, we know a lot more these days than we did back then, and we assume a lot of dinosaurs are quite intelligent, actually. They left the visitor area behind, and soon they, uh, they passed a grove of palm trees and saw a large, low, concrete shed with a roof, with a steel roof. The noise seemed to be coming from in there. It looked, they looked in the shed. Must be a generator, Ellie said. It's big, Grant said, peering inside. The power plant actually extended two stories below ground, below ground level, a vast complex of winding turbines and piping that ran down into the earth, lit by harsh electrical bulbs. They can't need all this just for a resort, Malcolm said. They're generating enough power here for a small city. Maybe for the computers? Maybe. Grant heard bleeding and walked north a few yards. He came to an animal enclosure with goats. By his count, by a quick count, he estimated there were about 50 or 60 goats. What's that for, Ellie asked. Beats me. Probably feed them to the dinosaurs. The group walked on, following a dirt path through a dense bamboo grove. At the far side, they came to a double-layered chain-link fence, 12 feet high, with spirals of barbed wire at the top. There was an electric hum along the outer fence. All right, folks, this is probably one of the best sequences in the entirety of the novel. Like, throughout the entire novel, this is one of my favorite parts. <clears throat> I'm going to try to make this, like, as good as I can. So give me one second. All right. Beyond the fences, Grant saw a dense cluster of large ferns, five feet high. He heard a snorting sound, a kind of snuffling, then the sound of crunching footsteps coming closer. Then a long silence. I don't see anything, Tim whispered finally. Shh. Grant waited. Several seconds passed. Flies buzzed in the air. He still saw nothing. And then Ellie tapped him on the shoulder and pointed. Amid the ferns, Grant saw the head of an animal. It was motionless, partially hidden in the fronds, and two large dark eyes watching them coldly. The head was two feet long. From a pointed snout, a long row of teeth ran back to the hole of the auditory metis, which served as an ear. The head reminded him of a large lizard, or perhaps a crocodile. The eyes did not blink, and the animal did not move. Its skin was leathery, with a pebbled texture and basically the same coloration as the infant's, yellow-brown with darker reddish marking, like the, strikes, like the stripes of a tiger. As Grant watched, a single forelimb reached up very slowly to part the ferns beside the animal's face, and the limb, Grant saw, was strong and muscular, was strongly muscled. The hand had three grasping fingers, each ending in curved claws. The hand gently, slowly pushed aside the ferns. Grant felt a chill and thought, he's hunting us. For a mammal-like man, there was something indescribably alien about the way reptiles hunted their prey. No wonder men hated reptiles. The stillness, the coldness, the pace was just all wrong. To be among alligators or other large reptiles was to be reminded of a very different kind of life, a different kind of world, now vanished from the earth. Of course, this animal didn't even realize that he had been spotted, or that he, or that he, the attack, <laughs> Grant's mind was cut off as the attack came suddenly from the left and right. Charging raptors covered the ten yards to the fence with shocking speed. Grant had a blurred imp impression of powerful, six-foot-tall bodies, stiff, balancing tails, and limbs with curving claws, open jaws with rows of ragged teeth, or jagged teeth. The animals snarled as they came forward and then leapt bodily onto the air, raising their hind legs with their big, dagger-like claws. Then they struck the fence in front of them, throwing off twin bursts of hot sparks. The velociraptors fell backwards onto the ground, hissing. The visitors all moved forward, fascinated, and only then did the third animal attack, leaping up to strike the fence at chest level. Tim screamed in fright as the sparks exploded all around him. 
The creature snarled, a low reptilian hissing sound, and leapt back among the ferns. Then they were gone, leaving behind the faint odor of decay and a hanging acrid smoke. Hey, Smash, thanks for hopping in here. Much appreciated. That's my buddy Eli, guys, so give me some big W's for Eli. Eli is in my uh, TikTok chat, but everybody on YouTube and Twitch, uh, too, that... Eli is uh, my buddy. He's appeared in a couple of my lives now. Some big W's for Eli. <clears throat> Holy shit, Tim said. It was so fast, Ellie said. Pack hunters, Grant said, shaking his head. Pack hunters for whom ambush is an instinct. Fascinating. I wouldn't call them tremendously intelligent, Malcolm said. On the other side of the fence, they heard snorting in the palm trees. Several heads poked slowly out of the foliage, and Grant crowned three, four, five. The animals watched them silently, staring coldly. A black man in coveralls came running up to them. Are you all right? We're okay, Grant said. The alarms were set off. The man looked at the fence, dented and charred. They attacked you? Three of them did, yes. The black man nodded. They do that all the time. Hit the fence, take a shock. They never seem to mind. Not too smart, are they, Malcolm said. The man paused and squinted at Malcolm in the afternoon light. Be glad for that fence, senor. And he turned and walked away. From beginning to end, the entire attack could not have taken more than six seconds. Grant was still trying to organize his impressions. The, the speed was astonishing. The animals were so fast he had hardly seen them move. Walking back, Malcolm said, they are remarkably fast. Yes, Grant said, much faster than any living reptile. A bull alligator can move quickly, but only for a short distance, five or six feet. Big lizards like the five-foot Komodo dragon of Indonesia have been clocked at 30 miles an hour, fast enough to run down a man, and they kill men all the time. But I'd guess the animal behind the fence was more than twice that fast. Cheetah speed, Malcolm said, 60, 70 miles an hour? Exactly. But they, see, but they seem to dart forward, rather like birds. Yes, in the contemporary world, only very small mammals, like the cobra-fighting mongoose, had such quick responses. Small mammals, and of course, birds. The snake-hunting secretary bird of Africa, or the cassowary. In fact, the velociraptor conveyed precisely the same impression of deadly, swift menace that Grant had seen in the cassowary, the clawed ostrich-like bird of New Guinea. So these velociraptors look like reptiles, with the skin and general appearance of reptiles, but they behave more like bird, with the speed and predatory intelligence of bird. Is that about it, Malcolm said? Yeah, I'd say they display a mixture of traits. Does that surprise you? Not really. It's actually rather close to what paleontologists believed a long time ago. Oof, da. Getting real hot in this mask, I tell you what. When the first giant bones were found in the 1820s and 1830s, scientists felt obliged to explain the bones as belonging to some oversized variant of a modern species. This was because it was believed that no species could ever become extinct since God would not allow one of his creations to die. Um, eventually, it became clear that this conception of God was mistaken and that the bones belonged to the extinct animals. But what kind of animals? In 1842, Richard Owen, the leading British anatomist of the day, called them Dinosauria, meaning terrible lizards. Owen recognized that dinosaurs seemed to combine traits of lizards, crocodiles, and birds, and in particular, dinosaur hips were bird-like, not lizard-like. And, unlike lizards, many dinosaurs seemed to stand upright. Owen imagined dinosaurs to be quick-moving, active creatures, and his views was accepted over the next 40 years. But when truly gigantic finds were unearthed, animals that weighed a hundred tons in life, scientists began to envision the dinosaurs as stupid, slow-moving giants destined for extinction. The, the image of the sluggish reptile gradually predominated over the image of the quick-moving bird, and in recent years, scientists like Grant had begun to swing back towards the idea of the more active dinosaur. Grant's colleagues saw him as radical in his conception of dinosaur behavior, but now he had to admit his own conceptions had fallen far short of the reality of these large, incredibly swift hunters. Actually, what I was driving at, Malcolm said, was this. Is it a persuasive animal to you? Is it, in fact, a dinosaur? I'd say so, yes. And the coordinated attack behavior? To be expected, Grant said. According to the fossil record, packs of velociraptors were capable of bringing down animals that weighed a thousand pounds, like Tenontosaurus, which could run as fast as a horse. Coordination would be required. How would they do it without language? Oh, language isn't necessary for coordinated hunting, Ellie said. Chimpanzees do it all the time. 
A group of chimps will stalk a monkey and kill it. All communication is by eyes. And were the dinosaurs, in fact, attacking us? Yes. And they would kill us and eat us if they could. I think so. The reason I ask, Malcolm said, is that I'm told large predators such as lions and tigers are not born man-eaters. Isn't that true? These animals must learn to, somewhere along the way that human beings are easy to kill, and only afterwards do they become man-killers. Yes, I believe that's true, Grant said. Well, these dinosaurs must be even more reluctant than lions and tigers. After all, they come from a time before human beings, or even large mammals existed at all. Gods know what they think when they see us, so I wonder... Have they learned somewhere along the line that humans are easy to kill? The group fell silent as they walked. In any case, Malcolm said, I shall be extremely interested to see the control room now. All right, folks. We're going to take one more pause break. This will probably be the last pause of the reading session. And then we'll read one more chapter and end it there for the day. Give me one second here. I promise this time I will actually be be there. Oh, there's that. Woo! Hot, hot, hot. Hello to everybody in both chats. Much appreciated. Or I shouldn't say both chats, but all three chats. All right, folks, I'll give you the option. Um, I'll give you guys the option right now. Do you guys want me to read two more chapters or one more chapter? Give me a one for one more chapter. Give me a two for two more chapters. And let me know in the chat here. Do you guys want just one more chapter or two more? Because I'll do two more if you guys really want me to. I'm seeing a couple one I'm seeing a couple twos. Two. Three. I'm not gonna go all the way to Nedry tonight. That's about a hundred more pages from where I am right now. So we're not gonna go all the way to Nedry today. Um, but it looks like a majority of the people are saying two. So we'll definitely do two more chapters then. Did my headset shut off again? No, I don't think so. Oh, it did shut off. Would you look at that? See, it's a wireless headset, folks. So it's got these, uh, I've got to, like, if it doesn't hear anything coming from inside the headset, it just shuts them off automatically after so long. All cats are related to one another, Malaysian. I'm not entirely sure if they are direct relatives. I would have to actually double check research on that because I I don't know cats are not my specialty, but I do I have been learning more about cats ever since I started this channel. So, hopefully I can let you know here within the next couple of days or so. But I'll I'll look into it. I'll see what I can find on that information. Uh One and two, It's Your Boy, was to vote for if we wanted to read one more chapter or two. And we're going to end up reading two more chapters because that's what most people voted for. Uh, we'll not be finishing the entire novel today, but we will be getting through a, a decent amount of it. I mean, we're already like over 100 pages in, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's getting there. The, the book is also only 400 pages, so there's not a lot, like, it's not like super long, you know what I'm saying? But it's long enough, and I I love it every time. Um, also, uh, if you folks, I'm genuinely curious. Are you folks interested in me reading books that are not Jurassic Park two? Like I've got Lord of the Rings and other things like that that I would love to read for you guys. Not exactly Jurassic Park, but it's I think it'd still be cool to read. So if you guys are interested in that, make sure you you let me know in comments and stuff on videos. Raptor Red would be cool. I don't, unfortunately, own a copy of Raptor Red. Top five favorite dinosaurs is a complicated question to ask. I mean, one's probably Giganotosaurus, two's probably Pachyrhinosaurus, but beyond that, I don't know for sure. 
See, that's what I'm thinking. I think Lord of the Rings would be a great one to do. Raptor Red would be excellent to do, in my opinion. I would just need to get a copy of it, which shouldn't be too too difficult. But yeah, I've got Lord of the Rings. I've got uh, get the Game of Thrones series. The th my issue with Game of Thrones is I don't want to read it because it's not even a completed series yet, so it'd just be kind of a... Uh, you know... We could always read the Aragon series too. Those are those are some of my other favorites. I've got those books here. Raptor Red is a book written by a paleontologist about a Utah raptor, if I remember correctly. Definitely a very, very cool book. While you're waiting for your cake to freeze. Why is a cake freezing? Is it an ice cream? Ice cream and cakey cake. Ice cream and cakey cake. Ice cream and cake to the ice cream and cake. Ice cream and cake to the ice cream and cake. I don't know if you guys ever saw that commercial back in the day, but that was a Dairy Queen commercial with like a T-Rex going back and forth like this. It, it was pretty funny. Look that up. Look look up the ice cream and cakey cake commercial if you're, if you're a youngin' who hasn't seen it. Alrighty. Oh, that's unfortunate. Give me just a moment here, and I'll be back, folks. Alright, TikTok, I'm back. Give me one second, I'll be back on YouTube and Twitch as well. Bada bing, bada boom. Once I see it. Super Fryland, thank you for following. Same with you, Myrez. Uh, everyone who's been following me here on Twitch, much appreciated. Give me some W's for the Twitch chat, guys. Just honestly, because Twitch... Look, I, I appreciate both YouTube and Twitch, but I, I've got a lot less uh, folks on Twitch, so I appreciate them. I have actually read Murtaugh. It's actually sitting on my couch right now behind me. I love the Murtaugh book. Very, very good. All right. This next chapter is called Version 4.4. Uh, let me just make sure. Was there any problem with the group, Hammond asked? Or, let's try to do an accent, huh? Was there any problem with the group, Hammond asked? No, Henry Wu said. There was no problem at all. They accepted your explanation? Why shouldn't they? It's all quite straightforward in the broad strokes. It's only the details that get sticky. And I wanted to talk about the details with you today. You can think of it as a matter of aesthetics. John Hammond wrinkled his nose as if he smelled something disagreeable. Aesthetics, he repeated. They were standing in the living room of ha Hammond's elegant bungalow, set back on, among palm trees in the northern sector of the park. The living room was airy and comfortable, fitted with a half a dozen video monitors showing the animals in the park. The file Wu had brought, stamped Animal Development version 4.4, lay on the coffee table. Hammond was looking at him in that patient, paternal way. Wu, 33 years old, was acutely aware that he had worked for Hammond all of his professional life, and Hammond had hired him right out of graduate school. Of course... There are practical consequences as well, Wu said. I really think you should consider my recommendation for Phase 2. We should go to version 4.4. You want to replace all the current stock of animals, Hammond said? You want to replace all the current stock of animals, Hammond said. Yes, I do. Why? What's wrong with them? Nothing, Wu said, except that they're real dinosaurs. Well, that's what I asked for, Henry, Hammond said, smiling, and that's what you gave me. I know, Wu said, but you see, he paused. How could he explain this to Hammond? Hammond hardly ever visited the island, and it was, per it was a peculiar situation that Wu was trying to convey. Right now, as we stand here, almost no one in the world has ever seen an actual dinosaur. No one knows what they're really like. Yes. The dinosaurs we have now are real, Wu said, pointing to the screens around the room. But in a certain way, they feel unsatisfactory, unconvincing. I could make them better. Better in what way, Wu? 
For one thing, they move too fast, Henry Wu said. People aren't accustomed to seeing large animals that are so quick. I'm afraid visitors will think the dinosaurs look speeded up, like film running too fast. But Henry, these are real dinosaurs. You said so yourself. I know, Wu said, but we could... But we could easily breed slower, more domesticated dinosaurs. Domesticated dinosaurs? Hammond snorted. Nobody wants domesticated dinosaurs, Henry. They want the real thing. But that's my point, Wu said. I don't think they do. They want to see their expectation, which is quite different. Hammond was frowning. You said yourself, John, this park is entertainment, Wu said. And entertainment has nothing to do with reality. Entertainment is antithetical to reality. Hammond sighed. Now, Henry, are we going to have another one of these abstract discussions? You know I like to keep it simple. The dinosaurs we have now are real, and, well, not exactly, Wu said. He paced the living room, pointing it to the monitors. I don't think we should kid ourselves. We haven't recreated the past here. The past is gone. It can never be recreated. What we've done is reconstruct the past, or at least a version of the past. And all I'm saying is we can make a better version. Better than real? Why not, Wu said. After all, all these animals are already modified. We've ensured the de- genes to make them patentable and to make them hot, lysine dependent. And we've done everything we could to promote growth and accelerate development into adulthood. Hammond shrugged. That was ine- inevitable. We didn't want to wait. We have investors to consider. Of course, but I'm just saying, why stop there? Why not push ahead to make exactly the kind of dinosaur that we'd like to see? One that is more acceptable to visitors and one that is easier for us to handle a slower, more docile version for our park. Hammond frowned. But the dinosaurs wouldn't be real, Henry. But they're not real now, Wu said. That's what I'm trying to tell you. There isn't any reality here. He shrugged helplessly. He could see he wasn't getting through. Hammond had never been interested in technical details, and the essence of the argument was technical. How could he explain to Hammond about the reality of DNA dropouts, the patches, the gaps in the sequences that Wu had been obliged to fill in, making the best guesses... (coughs) (coughs) Making the best guesses he could, but still making guesses. The DNA of the dinosaurs was like old photographs that had been retouched, basically the same as the original, but in some places repaired and clarified, and as a result, now... Henry, Hammond said, putting his arm on Wu's shoulder. If you don't mind me saying so, I think you're getting cold feet. You have been working very hard for a long time, and you've done a hell of a job. A hell of a job. And it's finally time to reveal to some people what you've done. It's natural to be a little nervous, to have some doubts. But I am convinced, Henry, that the world will be entirely satisfied. Entirely satisfied. As he spoke, Hammond began to steer him toward the door. But John, Wu said, remember back in 87 when we started to build the containment devices? We didn't have any full-grown adults yet, so we had to predict what we'd need. We ordered big taser shockers, cars with cow prods mounted on them, guns that blow out electrical nets, all built specifically to our specifications. We've got a whole array of devices now, and they're all too slow. We've got to make some adjustments, you know. You know that Muldoon wants military equipment, tow missiles, and later laser-guided devices? Let's leave Muldoon out of this, Hammond said. I'm not worried. It's just a zoo, Henry. The phone rang, and Hammond went to answer. Wu tried to think of another way to press his case, but the fact was just that, after five years, Jurassic Park was nearing completion, and John Hammond just wasn't listening to him anymore. Ah, chocolate. I remember when they first invented chocolate. Sweet, sweet chocolate. I always hated it. Sorry, I just saw that in chat here, so I I had to. Chocolate! You want some chocolate? Oh, I heard a little buzzy buzz buzz. Christopher James, thanks for subscribing. Much appreciated. Was it the Park of 87? Jesus Christ. Five Nights at Freddy fans are here, and and they're trying to come for me. There had been a time when Hammond listened to Wu very attentively, especially when he had first recruited him back in the days when Henry Wu was ju- when Henry Wu was a 28-year-old graduate student getting out of his doctorate at Stanford in, Northern, in Norman Atherton's lab. Atherton's death had thrown the lab into confusion as well as mourning. No one knew what would happen to the funding of the doctoral programs. There was a lot of uncertainty, and people worried about their careers. Two weeks after the funeral, John Hammond came to see Wu. 
Everyone in the lab knew that Atherton had some association with Hammond, although the details were never clear. But Hammond had approached Wu with a directness Wu never forgot. Norman always said you were the best geneticist in his lab. What are your plans now? I don't know. Research? You want, an, you want a university appointment? Yes. Mm, that's a mistake, Hammond said broadly. At least if you respect your talent. Wu had to blink. Why? Because let's face facts, Hammond said. Universities are no longer the intellectual centers of the country. The very idea is preposterous. Universities are the backwater. Don't look so surprised. I'm not saying anything you don't know. Since World War II, all the really important discoveries have come out of private laboratories. The laser, the transistor, the polio vaccine, the microchip, the hologram, the personal computer, magnet magnetic... Magnetic resonance imaging, CAT scans, the list goes on and on. Universities simply aren't where it's happening anymore, and they haven't been for 40 years. If you want to do something important in computers or genetics, you're going to have to do it. You, you don't go to a university. Dear me, no. <clears throat> Wu found he was speechless. Good heavens, Hammond said. What you must go through to start a new project. How many grant applications? How many forms? How many approvals? The steering committee, the department chairman, the university's resource committee. How do you get more work if you don't, if you don't, how do you get more workspace if you need it? More assistance if you need them? How long does all that take? A brilliant man can't squander precious times with forms and committees. Life is too short and DNA too long. You want, you want to make your mark? If you want to get something done, stay out of universities. In those days, Wu desperately wanted to make his mark, and John Hammond had his full attention. I'm talking about work, Hammond continued. Real accomplishment. What does a scientist need to work? He needs time, and he needs money. I'm talking about giving you a five-year commitment and $10 million in funding. $50 million... Huh? $50 million, and no one tells you how to spend it. You decide. Everyone else just gets out of your way. It just sounded too good to be true. Wu was silent for a long time, and finally he said, In return for what? For taking a crack at the impossible, Hammond said, smiling. For trying something that probably can't be done. What does it involve? I can't give you the details quite yet, but the general area involves cloning reptiles. I don't think that's impossible, Wu said. Reptiles are easier than mammals. Cloning's probably only 10, 15 years off, assuming some fundamental advances. I've got five years, Hammett said, and a lot of money for someone who wants to take a crack at it now. Is, that, is my work publishable? Eventually. Not immediately? No. But eventually publishable, Wu asked, sticking to the point. Hammett had laughed. Don't worry. If you succeed, the whole world will know about what you've done. I promise you. <clears throat> I think the book came out in 90, actually. I'm not positive what year it came out, but the book is uh, quite old itself. And now it seemed that the world indeed would know, Wu thought. After five years of extraordinary effort, they were just a year away from opening the park to the public. Of course, those years hadn't gone exactly as Hammond had promised. Wu had had some people telling him what to do, and many times fearsome pressures were placed on him, at the, and the work itself had shifted. It wasn't even reptilian cloning once they began to understand the dinosaurs were so similar to birds. It was avian cloning, a very different proposition and much more difficult. And for the last two years, Wu had been primarily an administrator, supervising teams of researchers and banks of computer-operated gene sequencers. Administration wasn't the kind of work he had relished. It wasn't what he had bargained for. Still, he had succeeded. He had done what nobody else believed could be done, and at least in, a, in so short a time, and Henry Wu thought he should have some rights, some say in what happened by virtue of his expertise and his efforts. Instead, he found his influence waning. What? Instead, he found his influence waning with each passing day. The dinosaurs existed. The procedures for obtaining them were worked out to the point of being routine. The technologies were mature, and John Hammond didn't need Henry Wu anymore. That should be fine, Hammond said, speaking into the phone. He listened for a while and smiled at Wu. Fine, yes, fine. He hung up. Where were we, Henry? We were talking about phase two, Wu said. Oh, yes. We've gone over this before. I know, but you don't realize... Excuse me, Henry, Hammond said with an edge of impatience in his voice. I do realize. I must tell you frankly, Henry, I see no reason to impose... 
to improve upon reality. Every change we made in the genome has been forced on us by law or necessity. We must make other changes in the future to resist disease or for other reasons. But I don't think we should improve upon reality just because we think it's better that way. We have real dinosaurs out there now, and that's what people want to see. And that's what they should see. That's our obligation, Henry. That's honesty, Henry. And smiling, Hammond opened the door for him to leave. Welcome back, everyone who's joining. And uh, goodbye to folks who are leaving. That was the end of that chapter and we will enter into our last chapter for the night here um this ch unless it's a super short chapter if this chapter is super sh short i'll read one more but if it's not we'll, this will be the last one tonight <clears throat> grant looked at all the computer monitors grant looked at all the computer monitors on the darkened control room feeling irritable Grant didn't like computers, and he knew that this made him old-fashioned, dated as a researcher, but he didn't care. Some of the kids who worked for him had a real feeling for computers, an intuition. Grant never felt that. He found computers to be alien, mystifying machines. Even the fundamental distinction between an operating system and an application left him confused and disheartened, literally lost in foreign geography he didn't begin to comprehend. But he noticed that Gennaro was perfectly comfortable, and Malcolm seemed to be in his element, making little sniffing sounds like a bloodhound on a trail. You want to know about control mechanisms, John Arnold said, turning in his chair to the control room. The head engineer was a thin, tense, chain-smoking man of 45. He squinted at the others in the room. We have unbelievable control mechanisms, Arnold said, and lit another cigarette. For example, Gennaro said. For example, animal tracking. Arnold pressed a button on, the, on his console and the vertical glass map lit up with the pattern of jagged blue lines. That's our juvenile T-Rex, the little Rex. All his movements within the park over the last 24 hours. Arnold pressed the button again. Previous 24, and again, previous 24. The lines on the map became densely overlaid. A child scribbled, but the scribble was localized in a single area near the southeast side of the lagoon. You get a sense of his home range over time, Arnold said. He's young, but he stays close to the water, and he stays away from the big adult Rex. You put, the, you put up that big Rex and the little Rex, and you'll see that their pathways never cross. Where's the big Rex right now, Gennaro asked. Arnold pushed another button, and the map cleared, and a single glowing spot with a code with a code number appeared in the fields northwest of the lagoon. He's right there. <clears throat> Sorry. The book it's, is a little heavy, so i got to readjust it sometimes to make it more comfortable to hold. And the little Rex? Hell, I'll show you every animal in the park, Arnold said. The map began to light up like a Christmas tree, dozens of spots of light, each tagged with a code number. That's 238 animals as of this moment. How accurate? Within five feet, Arnold puffed, puffed on the cigarette. Let's put it this way. You drive out in a vehicle and you will find these animals right there, exactly as they're shown on the maps. How often is it updated? Every 30 seconds. That's pretty impressive. How's it done? Gennaro asked. Wu has, we have motion sensors all over the park. Most of them hardwired, some radio telemetered. Of course, motion sensors won't tell you won't usually tell you the species, but we get image recognition direct off the video. Even when we're not watching the video monitors, the computer is, and the checking where everybody is. Does the computer ever make mistakes? Only with the babies. It mixes those up sometimes because they're always such small images, but we don't sweat that. It, the babies almost always stay close to the herds of the adults. Also, you, you have to category, ta category tally. What's that? Once every 15 minutes, the computer tallies all the animal categories, like this. Arnold hits a button and... Once again, we are given a chart. So this little chart here, this chart shows us the dinosaur species, the expected number, the found number, and then the version. So species, expected number, found number, version. And then let me make sure that you folks on YouTube and TikTok can see this as well, or on YouTube and Twitch. So species, expected, found, version. Um, and just for reference, some of these numbers are extraordinary. There's two T-Rexes, you know, 49 compies, stuff like that. A lot of animals, 238. <clears throat> oh, I skipped a page. 
What you see here, Arnold said, is an ex entirely separate counting procedure. It isn't based on the tracking data, it's a fresh look. The whole idea is that the computer can't make a mistake because it compares two different ways of gathering the data. If an animal were missing, we'd know within five minutes. I see, Malcolm said, and as has there ever actually been tested? Well, in a way, Arnold said, we had a few animals die, and old Anelian got caught in the branches of a tree and strangled. One of the, st one of the stegos died of, in of that intestinal illness that keeps bothering them. One of the hisphilodonts fell and broke his neck. And in each case, once the animal stopped moving, the numbers stopped tallying, and the computer signaled an alert. Within five minutes. Yep. What is the right-hand columns? Release version of the animals. The most recent are 4.1 or 4.3, and we're considering going to version 4.4. Version numbers? You mean like software? New releases? Well, yes, Arnold said. It is kind of like software, in a way. And we discover the glitches in the DNA. Dr. Wu's lab has to make a new version. <clears throat> oh, my back's a little... Need a little crack there. The idea of living creatures being numbered like software, being subject to updates and revisions, troubled Grant. He could not exactly say why. It was too new a thought, but he was instinctively uneasy about it. They were, after all, living creatures. Arnold must have noticed his expression because he said, Look, Dr. Grant, there's no point getting starry-eyed about these animals. It's important for everyone to remember that these animals are created. Created by man. Sometimes there are bugs. So we discover the bugs. Dr. Wu's lab have to make a new version. And we need to keep track of what that version we have out there. Yes, yes, of course you do, Malcolm said impatiently. But going back to the matter of counting, I take it all the counts are based on motion sensors. Yes. And these sensors are everywhere in the park? They cover 92% of the land area. There's only a few places we can't use them. For example, we can't use them on the Jungle River because the movement of the water and the convection rising from the surface screws up the sensors. But we have them nearly everywhere else. And if the computer tracks an animal into an unsensed zone, it'll remember and look for the animal to come out again. Jay, thank you very much for subscribing. Much appreciated. But remember to look for the animal to come out again, and if it doesn't, it gives us an alarm. Now then, Malcolm said, you show 49 procomsognathids. Suppose I suspect that some of them aren't really the correct species. How would you show me that I'm wrong? Two ways, Arnold said. First, I can track all individual movements against the other presumed compies. Compies are social animals. They move in a group. We have two compy groups in the park, so the individual should be within either group A or B. Yes, but the other is direct visual, he said. He punched buttons and... Uh, and one of the monitors began to flick rapidly through images of compies numbered 1 to 49. These pictures are current ID images from within the last five minutes. So you can see all the animals if you want to? Yeah, I could visually res review all the animals whenever I want. How about physical containment, Gennaro said. Can they get out of their enclosures? Absolutely not, Arnold said. These are expensive animals, Mr. Gennaro. We take very good care of them. We maintain multiple barriers. First, the moats. He pressed a button and the board lit up with a network of of orange bars. These moats are never less than 20 feet deep and water filled. For big animals, the moats may be 30 feet deep. Next, the electrified fences. Lines of bright red glowed on the board. We have 50 miles of 12 foot high fencing, including 22 miles around the perimeter of the island. All of the park fences carry 10,000 volts. The animals quickly learn not to go anywhere near them. But if one did get out, Gennaro said. Arnold snorted and stubbed out a cigarette. Just hypothetically, Supposing it happened, Gennaro said. Muldoon cleared his throat. We'd go out and get the animal back, he said. We have lots of ways to do it. Taser shotguns, electrified nets, tranquilizers, all non-lethal, because as Mr. Arnold says, these are expensive animals. Gennaro nodded. And if one gets off the island, it'd die in less than 24 hours. These are genetically engineered animals. They're unable, they're unable to survive in the real world. How about the control system itself, Gennaro said. Could anybody tamper with it? Arnold was shaking his head. The system is hardened. The computers are independent in every way. Independent power and independent backup power. The system does not communicate with the outside, so it cannot be influenced remotely by modem. The computer system is secure. There was a pause, and Arnold puffed out a cigarette. Hell of a system, he said. Hell of a goddamn system. Then I guess, Malcolm said, your systems work so well you don't have any problems. Arnold snorted. We've got endless problems here, he said, raising an eyebrow, but none of the things you worry about. I gathered you worry about the animals will escape and we'll get to the mainland and raise hell. We haven't got any concern about that at all. We see these animals as fragile and delicate. They've been brought back after 65 million years to a world that's very different from the one they left. And the, 
and the one they were adapted to. We have a hell of a time caring for them. You have to realize, I don't continue, that men have been keeping mammals and reptiles in zoo for hundreds of years, so we know a lot about the how to take care of an elephant or a croc, but nobody has ever tried to take care of a dinosaur before. They are new animals, and we just don't know, and we just don't know. Diseases in our animals are the biggest concern. Diseases? Gennaro asked, suddenly alarmed. Is there any way that a visitor could get sick? Gennaro snor or Arnold snorted again. You ever catch a cold from a zoo alligator, Mr. Gennaro? Zoos don't worry about that, and neither do we. What we do worry about is the animals dying from their own illnesses or infecting other animals. But we have programs to monitor that, too. You want to see the Big Rex's health file, his, vaccina his vaccination record, his dental record? That's something. You ought to see the vet scrubbing those big fangs so he doesn't get tooth decay. Now, just now. Not just now, Gennaro said. What about your mechanical systems? You mean the rides, Arnold said. Grant looked up sharply. Rides? None of the rides are running yet, Arnold said. We have the Jungle River ride, where the boats follow tracks under the water, and we have the Avery Lodge ride, but none of it's operational yet. The park will open with the basic dinosaur tour, the one you're about to take in a few minutes. Then the other rides will come on six, twelve months after that. Wait a minute, Grant said. You're going to have rides? Like an amusement park? <clears throat> Arnold said, this is a zoological park. We have, a ton we have tours of different areas, and we call them rides. That's all. Grant frowned. Again, he felt trouble. Didn't like the idea of dinosaurs being used for an amusement park. You can run the whole park from this control room, Malcolm continued his questions. Yes, Arnold said. I can run it single-handedly if I have to. We've got that much automation built in. The computers by itself can track the animals, feed them, and fill their water troughs for 48 hours without supervision. This is the system that Mr. Nedry designed, Malcolm asked. Dennis Edry was sitting at a terminal on the far right corner of the room, eating a candy bar and typing. Yeah, that's right, Nedry said, not looking up from the keyboard. It's a hell of a system, Arnold said proudly. That's right, Nedry said absently. Just one or two minor bugs to fix. Now, Arnold said, I see the tour is starting, so unless you have other questions... Actually, just one, Malcolm said. Just a research question. You showed us that you can, tra pr you can track the procomsognathids. You can visually display them individually. Can you do any studies of them as a group? Measure them or whatever? I wanted to know height or weight or... Arnold was punching buttons already. Another screen came up. So, once again, we get a chart here. Uh, so this is just showing... What is this? Oh, height distribution of procomsognathids in the park. So, this is important. This, this will be important um, for those of you. Basically, it just looks like a basic graph, right? Showing the height of the compies. And uh, you'll understand why this is important. Another screen came up. We can do all of that and very quickly, Arnold said. The computer table measured data in the, in the course of reading the video screens, so it's translatable all at once. You see here we have a normal Gaussian distribution for the animal population. It shows that most of the animals cluster around an average central value, and a few are either larger or smaller than the average at the tail of the curve. You'd expect that kind of graph, Malcolm said. Yes, any healthy biological population shows this kind of distribution. Now then, Arnold said, lighting a cig another cigarette. Are there any other questions? No, Malcolm said. I've learned what I need to know. As they were walking out, Gennaro said, It looks a pretty good system to me. I don't see how any animals could get off the island. Don't you? Malcolm said. I thought it was completely obvious. Wait a minute, Gennaro said. You think animals have gotten out? Oh, no, no, I don't think. I know they have, Malcolm said. Gennaro seemed confused. But how? You saw for yourself. They can count all the animals. They can look at all the animals. They know where all the animals are at all times. How can one possibly escape? Malcolm smiled. It's quite obvious. It's just a matter of your assumptions. Your assumptions, Gennaro repeated, frowning. Yes, Malcolm said. Look here. The basic event that has occurred in Jurassic Park is that the scientists and technicians have tried to make a new, complete biological world, and the scientists in that control room expect to see a natural world, as in the graph they just showed us, even though a moment's thoughts reveals that nice, normal distribution is terribly worrisome on, on this island. It is? Yes. Based on what Dr. Wu told us earlier, no one should see a population graph like that. Why not? Because that graph is for a normal biological population, which is precisely what Jurassic Park is not. Jurassic Park is not the real world. It is intended to be a controlled world that only imitates the natural world. In that sense, it's like a true park, rather like a Japanese formal garden. Nature manipulated to be more natural than the real thing, if you will. 
I'm afraid you've lost me, Gennaro said. I'm sure the tour will make everything clearer, Malcolm replied. And that is the end of that chapter. And that will be the last chapter we read tonight here on the live stream. <clears throat> <laughs> hey, I mean, I hope you enjoy the Jurassic Park audiobook. It's a very good audiobook, if you ask me. Um, give me just a second here. I'm just going to go into the... I'm not sure. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So... That would be the end. That will be our end for the tonight, folks. I hope everybody enjoyed that. Uh, I'm T Rex. Thank you for the follow on Twitch. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. And um, everybody here on Twitch, thank you guys all for watching so very much. Doctor Nightmare, thank you once again for being a, a, our new subscriber. I'm sorry you got back just as I'm ending it. I I feel kind of bad about that. Um, but this live will still be up on. Uh, Twitch for quite some time, and if you can't find it on Twitch, you can find it on YouTube on, on, at the Dino Facts. Um, I hope everybody had a wonderful time tonight, and uh, I will see you all next time. You guys remember to 